Good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting in 2022 of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. We are joined today in the public gallery by members of the California Lawyers Association and I welcome you all to the Scottish Parliament. We also have apologies this morning from Ross Greer and Daniel Johnson. Uh, the first item on our agenda is an evidence session with Scottish Government officials on a financial memorandum to the National Care Service Scotland Bill. And I therefore welcome to the meeting Donna Bell, a Director of Social Care and National Care Service Development, and Fiona Bennett, Interim Director for the NHS Integration Social Care Finance at the Scottish Government. So, I understand, Donna, you would like to make a short opening statement. Thank you very much, convener, and thank you for having us along today to give evidence and to take questions on the NCS Bill Financial Memorandum. This is an enabling bill which sets out a number of provisions. Uh, the National Care Service, as proposed in the bill, will bring together social work, social care and community health to strengthen health and social care integration for adult services. By the end... Yeah. Difficult to hear you, actually. Of course. Yeah, I think other members are too. Okay. So, by the end of this Parliament, accountability for adult social work and care support will transfer from local government to Scottish ministers. A decision has not yet been taken on whether children's services or justice social work will be included in the scope of the National Care Service. The Scottish Government are currently establishing a programme of gathering evidence and undertaking research to inform these future decisions. The aim of the National Care Service is to improve consistent, fair and high quality care for everyone in Scotland, reducing the current variations across Scotland that many people have raised over recent years. Important to note that this is not about nationalisation of services. The proposed bill sets out that at a national level, the functions are focused on consistency through national oversight. Services will continue to be designed and delivered locally. That is right to support delivery with and for our communities and the people that they serve. The principles of any new system will be person-centred with human rights at the heart of social care. This means that the NCS will be delivered in a way that respects, protects and fulfils the human rights of people accessing care support and their carers. The NCS Bill sets out a framework for change. The detail relies very much on co-design, and that is co-design with people, uh, people with lived experience of and people who deliver community health and care support. Our partners and stakeholders will also play a vital role in that co-design moving forward. The delivery of social services in their widest sense has been reviewed and revised a number of times since devolution. The independent review of adult social was clear that <coughs> each time um, there has been a gap between legal uh, and policy intent and delivery. This new and different approach to drafting the detail intends to reduce that gap and to deliver public service improvement collaboratively. The financial memorandum sets out the estimated costs for establishing and running the National Care Service and the proposed local care boards. It doesn't cover any proposed changes to wider policy, such as those set out in the independent review of <coughs> social care, for example, reopening the independent living fund or free personal nursing care rates. Integrated health and social care has long been the joint ambition of local and national government. But people who access and deliver care have told us that it isn't delivering the quality of services needed consistently. Combining national oversight with local expertise will ensure that the right balance can be struck in ensuring consistent and fair quality of service provision across Scotland. It will allow for better sharing of good practice and innovation and remove unwarranted duplication of functions, making best use of public funds. The financial memorandum does include significant assumptions on required investments in pay terms and conditions for frontline local government care staff if they were to transfer to the National Care Service. Discussions across the local government about their future role have not concluded. The approach taken to the financial memorandum was to ensure that the broadest range of costs was provided to Parliament to promote transparency. And just finally, to be clear, we're not waiting for the National Care Service to start improving social care. We're already taking steps to improve outcomes for people accessing care and support, and our priority will continue to be maximising frontline spending. The Scottish Government's commitment to fair work and the support for fair pay and conditions is a long-standing policy and will be embedded into the values of the new National Care Service. 
by rewarding the va and valuing the workforce to deliver the best possible service for the people of Scotland, we will make the sector fit for the future and more attractive to people coming into the profession. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that opening statement. And you'll understand, given the submissions we've received, um, that uh, there's likely to be a number of um, questions from myself and colleagues around the table. So I'm going to open up straight away with the submissions from uh, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, who say, and I quote, um, the long-term resourcing of the National Care Service in, in matters in relation to borrowing, holding of reserves, pensions, audit and VAT and shared services. Uh, disappointingly, the draft bill memoranda do not address these points explicitly, and there is an unacceptable lack of clarity. And one of the, the issues that, that came very much to the fore in all the submissions was when we asked them, did you have enough time for the consultation? Every one of them answered with a one-word answer, which was no. And when we asked them to elaborate on that, they actually said that, well, it was over the summer, it was far too short, given the magnitude of the bill that's actually before us and the, the depth uh, of the financial memorandum, uh, which is one of the most detailed, if not the most detailed, I've ever seen. So how do you respond to to those concerns uh, on, on those, uh, those issues that I've raised? Thank you, Convener. So the consultation was um, very well um, responded to. Um, so the consultation took place um, over the course of a number of months, as you would expect. Um, overall, responses were received from 1,291 respondents. Uh, and um, they, were, they expressed a variety of views. So we did get a very good response to the consultation. What people are saying is that for a, a bill of this magnitude, it simply wasn't long enough to provide the detailed responses that, that, that people would have liked to have given. So why was it, why was it um, uh, constrained in the way it was that the length of the consultation? Surely for something it's so momentous, you know, including the transfer, for example, of 75,000 staff, one would have thought that, 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 that getting it right was the most important thing, and therefore that the consultation could have and should have been extended to allow for uh, more detailed deliberations, especially, as I mentioned, it's over the summer when, when there, was, there was a lot of disruption. People come out of the pandemic when folk aren't, you know, they've not got the same um, uh, 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 Zoom standing and the ability to communicate with colleagues, etc. So wh why was there not more time given to people to, to actually uh, tease out a lot of the issues that have been raised as a result? So the time given for the consultation was in line with the time given for any other consultation um, on legislation. I think it's important to note that there, um, this is an enabling bill um, and um, there is significant detail that is yet to be worked out through the co-design process. So um, while um, the consultation has focused on the primary legislation at this point, there will be a significant opportunity to continue to um, consult, um, and particularly around the co-design point. Um, the, the difference with this bill is that we will um, work with people to co-design um, the detail, which will give people plenty of opportunity to engage on um, the very detailed matters that you have raised in your comments, Indina. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think, to be honest, though, it looks to me and I think many others that we could be building a house on sand here. I mean, you have to get the primary legislation right first before you can really think over secondary legislation. And, uh, I mean, I, I'm struggling to remember when I've actually had such uh, submissions that have been quite so excoriating uh, uh, with regard to such a bill in terms of financial aspects of it. Uh, I, I mean, basically, I mean, for example, another thing that the cause I've, I've, I've talked about is the fact that there was no business case just before the draft bill to set out the rationale, costs, benefits, and risks of the National Care Service to facilitate me meaningful scrutiny by Parliament. So again, why why would that? Why is not that not been? been done in terms of the, the, the financial memorandum. I, mean, I know how bills have been done in the past. I mean, I've had financial memorandum in the, over the years have only necessitated one or two pages, and there's not been a lot of meat in them. But this is, this is a monumental change over a number of years, affecting an extremely vulnerable um, section of, our, of, of all our uh, communities. So, so surely much more 
uh, thought and depth should be put into the financial aspects of it and the de deliverability of it in, in financial terms? So I would agree it is a very uh, complex and um, significant uh, bill. I, um, in terms of the business case, so uh, the programme business case is um, in development at the moment and will be published shortly. I think given the nature and complexity of uh, the changes proposed, there will be, uh, I suspect, three business cases that will be brought forward um, to address um, the very specific nature of the change around the care boards, um, around the integrated health and social care record, and also on any organisational change that is required. So um, the work to develop the detail is underway at the moment, but again, that is subject to the co-design process, which will influence the final shape of the National Care Service um, as set out in the financial memorandum and in the bill itself. So there is detailed and um, in fact, very detailed work going on at the moment to set all of that out. And that will give Parliament and others the opportunity to scrutinise this in um, so, quite some detail. I mean, I'm interested that you mentioned the co-design phase a couple of times now. I mean, that there is a, a feeling uh, among organisations such as our, our local authorities that they're being bounced into this mm -hmm. and they're not, that the co-design is it's not really a, you know, a, a kind of meeting of minds or indeed equals in terms of this. So. How is this co-design actually going to work in terms of, and I'm thinking specifically about the financial structures, obviously, because that's a remit here rather than the, you know, the wider aspects. So we've already um, launched the lived experience expert panel and the stakeholder panel that happened um, just in advance of the National Care Service Forum um, at the start of the month. So we've begun the co-design process and there are a number of events planned uh, to support that. I think um, we've been very clear with the, um, particularly with the people who use services that form has to follow function. And um, the important part of this is to work with people to understand what they need to deliver for them um, and with them. So, um, I'm, I'm not sure about your, your comments about being bounced. I, I'm, I, I yeah, haven't. That's, that's yeah. how people feel. You know, lack of consultation and almost imposition of how this is going to work rather than a, a working together to actually put, to put a system that might actually deliver over the next decade and beyond. That, that's really the kind of expression that I'm getting. I don't, know if colleague, I don't know if colleagues have got a different view, but that's certainly the impression I get from submissions that we've been getting and from speaking to my own local authority and others. Right, OK. So certainly um, the approach to co-design has been um, hugely welcomed by people who use services, by people who work in services. Um, the approach has been almost universally welcomed from people who want to be involved in shaping the National Care Service and shaping the delivery of services that they either use now or are likely to use in the future. So um, that, and that was certainly reinforced at the National Care Service Forum a few weeks ago. So there is huge enthusiasm for the co-design process. Um, it is in line with the Scottish approach to service design, which has been used in the development of uh, Social Security Scotland and has been very successful. Um, I, I think that the, the people who've been involved in that process have found it very useful. They've found it um, has improved both the development and the delivery of services for them. So certainly there, uh, there are clearly mixed views on the co-design process, but from what we hear from people who use and work in services, they are welcoming of this approach. Okay. Um, I think one of the, the concerns, again, all of some, some, the submissions that we've received um, expressed concern about is the VAT um, uh, baseline that's actually included in the figures on table two. And I mean, to be fair, I, I think obviously time has trundled on and I believe that you know this was obviously published before we had the, 
the latest skyrocketing levels of inflation. But it does say that the uh, and the response received from COSLA. Again, these figures are misleading, misleadingly uprated each year from a 2019-20 baseline by inflation plus 3 per cent, which does not reflect subsequent local government settlements. And this, I think, is important, given that, you know, that it, it was announced way back in May, that it's completely at odds with the reality presented with the Scottish Government's own resource spending review of a flat cash settlement. So, um, Surely that alone means that the financial memorandum is no longer fit for purpose and requires a, a, an updating at least. So there are slightly different basis for the two <coughs> figures that we, we mentioned there. The numbers shown in Table 2 are intended to show what may happen to spend over the coming years. So it's different from the resource spending review figures, which set out what the budget may look like. We do note that these are indicative figures while we do further work through that co-design process around the exact services that will be transferred. Inflation is another key point. This was written at a point in time in May. There has been significant changes to inflation since then, so we absolutely are keeping a live model behind the scenes of changes to any financial assumptions that take place. But I think it's just an important point to note that these are indicative future expenditure numbers rather than budget, which is what the, the RSR is intended to set out. Yeah, because I mean, what the, what the concern, of course, is that um, the cost use a starting point, current expenditure, and the actual cost of delivery of social care. And I think all those who are currently responsible for delivery of social care fear that um, there just won't be enough money, frankly, and, you know, for the delivery of this service, especially as we're already, as a parliament, under severe financial pressure. Local authorities are already facing uh, financial restrictions, and, and, and it, 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 we've got an ageing population. It's about how. How is this circle going to be squared? So, as noted, the financial memorandum doesn't intend to set out the full range of policy commitments that are being looked at in terms of social care. It is focused on the establishment of the National Care Service. Oh, yeah, no, I realise that. I mean, there's actually a number of caveats right at the start yeah. of the financial memorandum that make that, in spite of repeated that and their submission to us. So, I think we're actually aware of that. But at the same time, you know, there's a structure being developed here, actually, where is it lo which looks to have unrealistic parameters. And I think that's of concern to, to all of us. I suppose on the calculation method that we've used in terms of Table 2, we've, we've tried to be as transparent as possible. So we've taken publicly available data on expenditure for these services. We've used inflation, which is set out at the bottom of paragraph 30. And we've used the 3% inflator in terms of increasing demand if inflation goes above the figures there, which we know it has, etc. So we've tried to be transparent about how that's been calculated and we will do much further work with local authorities, etc. through that process to understand the true cost base. So uh, if, if that is the case and the true cost base is accepted, how will, where will resources come from in order to fund it? So that will ultimately be answered through the annual budget setting process. This financial memorandum, again, gives indicative costs of what relates to the provisions in the bill. Ultimately, we set budgets annually. Through the business case work that we've discussed, we'll have to think about that affordability. There's different processes for funding social care at the moment across local authorities through the different income streams from council tax, the general revenue grant from Scottish Government from charges from service users. So all of that will need to be carried out with a rigorous financial assessment to understand that. So what you're basically saying is ultimately local authorities may just have to find money for somewhere else? We've not, we've not went through that process yet mm -hmm. to know that. Okay. Uh, I'm, 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 I mean, there's mountains and mountains here, but I don't want other colleagues will obviously have their own questions to ask. I don't want to, to kind of steal all the thunder. But one thing I, I do want to talk about now is, is VAT because uh, looking at the financial memorandum directly, as opposed to submissions in paragraph 52, um, I, I don't know, I, it looks almost as if there's a kind of cavalier approach, a kind of fingers crossed and it'll be all right on the night kind of approach the way this has worked. So it talks about the requirement for more work engagement to determine the most suitable and affordable design in terms of pensions. And then it goes on in the VAT to say, if care boards are not able to reclaim VAT in, in a similar, similar area to uh, uh, integrated joint boards, there could be a significant financial impact. And then it goes on to say the work is underway to understand this potential cost and how it might be mitigated to ensure maximum support of frontline services. Uh, VAT costs are not assumed. So, I, I mean, how, how likely, I mean, I would have thought very likely, but how, what, what kind of level of certainty have you got that we will be able to deliver 
uh, you know, uh, this, uh, if, if we don't get the, the, the VAT kind of, um, you know, allowance that, uh, that we would hope for and that currently joint integration boards get. And I would just want to be clear that we're, we haven't taken a cavalier approach to this at all. No, no, I, um, I know you haven't. I'm just saying the way it's written is, is <laughs> in my view, is that it's a kind of well, if it happens that way, it happens that way. That, that I just, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm fully aware that you've spent countless hours on this, but it's just that just kind of jumped out at me on that. That you know that that felt as if well, we'll just have to work it out some other way. That's why I'm kind of a wee bit alarmed as to what the probability is that this will be resolved, given the, the financial impact it will obviously have. Yeah. Um, Fiona, do you want to...? Yeah, and to note the work we're doing at the moment on VAT. So we've engaged independent advice to fully understand the VAT consequences of any options that may be taken. Um, at the moment, Section 33 bodies can have full VAT recovery. Section 41 bodies can't, which are the type of bodies that NHS boards are. Depending on the way the care boards were set up, they could fall into either of those categories. There's currently a review from HM Treasury around whether Section 41 bodies will fall into the full recovery model going forward. So that decision will also have an impact on us. But ultimately, again, through that options appraisal and business case, we'll continue to seek independent expert advice to make sure we're fully aware of any VAT risks and mitigations. OK, and in terms of pensions, you know, there's a real concern here about... Uh, viability given the local government pension scheme is fully funded and whether or not the National Care Service would be able to be an admitted member of the scheme. Is there anything you can advise us on with that, in that regard? Yeah, so similarly we want to make sure we've got robust evidence before making any suggestions or options about what may happen with local government pension schemes. We've recently put out a contract on Public Contract Scotland to procure again for advice for that to make sure that we are given an unbiased and evidence-based approach. We would look to fully engage with 11 different local government pension schemes to understand the impact of any members moving out of those schemes. But ultimately, the bill provides the ability for those staff to move, but doesn't say that they definitely will. So again, it would have to be considered on a, a local authority by local authority basis. OK, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to ask uh, a, a couple more questions because I want colleagues to be able to come in. And one, is, uh, one is about charging and uh, SIPFA have basically asked about, they've said that there's concerns that the recommendation to increase fee personal and nursing care for self-funders will not necessarily deliver a reduction to the amount <coughs> paid by self-funders. So what's the thinking behind that? So the, the financial memorandum doesn't go into those recommendations, which were, I believe, based on the independent review around bringing free personal nursing care rates up to those in the National Care Home contract and potentially removal of non-residential charging. Both of those policies that area has been worked on in line with, but it can happen out with the National Care Service. So those are parts of the areas that we're looking at in conjunction with the National Care Service and the financial impacts of those will have to feed into our assessment of best value and affordability for the National Care Service going forward. Okay, and just one final one for me. I think one of the, the very positive aspects of the bill is the right to breaks from caring, but of course that again has cost and staffing implications. Um, so, again, what SIPFA said, there should be a, a role for professional assessment of need, as we see currently in social care and in the NHS. This will require financial investment in the professional workforce, but is dependent on the workforce being available. And I think that, to me, seems more of an issue, you know, because, I mean, we know that chronic shortage of people in the care sector, I think it's 300,000 uh, 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 across the UK were short. So, how deliverable is that going to be in terms of staff? I mean, what, 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 how... how how do you feel that we're going to be able to, to do that? I mean, given the, the workforce challenges that we have at the moment. Yeah, the, the workforce challenges are well understood. Um, we've been working very closely with COSLA. Um, I referred in the opening statement to the activity we're undertaking just now to improve social care services, um, and that has been done uh, on a joint basis with COSLA. Um, and local authorities and other partners. Um, so we have plans uh, underway at the moment to um, have a greater focus on workforce planning, on recruitment, on retention and on the activity on learning and development for social care staff um, because that has um, been one of the key issues that um, has, I think, impacted on retention 
um, along with pay terms and conditions. So there is um, some significant work underway at the moment to develop the social care workforce and to make sure that it is able to meet demand, both in terms of numbers, but also in terms of skills um, and um, capacity. Okay. Thank you for that. I'm sure colleagues have a, a number of other questions wish to ask. The first will be John to be followed by Michelle. Uh, thanks very much, uh, convener. So, you know, quite a lot in here, um, as the convener was saying. I mean, I, I understand the point that, uh, for example, pay of care workers is not, in, is not a part of this bill and therefore is not part of the financial memorandum. So whether or not care workers get paid more is, is something completely different. But on the rights to breaks from caring, so that carers uh, would have a right to a break, that is part of the bill. So should the co all the costs of that be in the financial memorandum? So I think it's um, the, the, obviously the purpose of the financial memorandum is to um, ensure that we are uh, costing the implications of the bill. I think we have been clear that there is work that um, is happening anyway. Um, I've already referred to the activity with COSLA. So um, while the, the two things are linked, it is not necessarily a direct implication of the, the bill around pay terms and conditions for staff. Right, the pay terms and conditions I get, but surely the break and the cost of the breaks for carers are part of the bill? Yes. And there is a... a, a well, and on the figures that are associated with the, in the financial memorandum. Fiona, I don't know if you want to go into a bit of detail about the assumptions. That yeah, so helpful. tables 12 and 13 um, set out the cost of easy access breaks and the additional cost for right to break. So as sort of noted in the previous two tables, 9 and 10, there's a number of different assumptions that, that would vary those costs. So things like whether it's residential or non-residential care that's most fitting to support that right to breaks, the, the length and the frequency of breaks, the number of people that would uptake that level of care, etc. So we, we have set out as best as we can in tables um, 12 and 13 the estimated costs of those additional rights to breaks. Mm -hmm. So that is included in the in yes. financial memorandum. So there's quite a lot of assumptions in there. Um, how, how, as you work on this and develop it, um, how will the Parliament and this committee be able to keep an eye on that? Because the point's been made that we do look at an FM in quite a lot of detail, but when it comes to secondary legislation, we don't often see much detail. So have you any thoughts about how this committee and the Parliament can look at that? Yeah, so I think, um, and I've, I've been clear already, we know that we have to do significant further work um, as the co-design process uh, proceeds to set out the financial implications, to set out um, the value for money questions um, that we need to answer. So we will um, be very happy and um, would expect actually to provide the committee with all of the information that we are producing. Um, ministers will expect us to do that so parliamentary scrutiny can take place. Um, so the arrangements can be made to, to do that. Right, so maybe, maybe every quarter, or once you get to a significant stage, you, you would, yeah. well, update, would, would you update the, the financial memorandum? Is that how it would be done? We would bring forward, um, so I've already referred to the business cases that we will produce um, that will set out the, um, the real detail of the, the costs and implications. So I think um, certainly providing the committee with those um, and with any updated financial projections as we move forward would um, be absolutely appropriate. Okay, thanks so much. Now, one of the points that Cosla and others raised was the fact that the present care service that they are providing will be partly funded by government grant and partly funded by council tax and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, I mean, to take a, a kind of round figure, say a particular council spending 100 million on care services. 80 million of that comes from grant, 20 million is they've raised locally by council tax. So when this transfers, would the government take the 80 million away from the council or would it take 100 million away from the council? 
So we've got a lot of work to do to work through um, all of those issues. I, I think it's fair to say that every council will have a different set of arrangements. Yes. The proportions will be different. Um, they will secure funding from um, a, a mix of sources, as we know. So we're going to have to work through that. And I think this is um, part of the business case uh, process that we'll need to work through for each of the care boards. Um, and that may differ across the country. Fiona, is there anything you want to add Yeah, to no, absolutely, that's right. And again, the, the affordability of the services provided by care boards will absolutely have to be rigorously assessed before a final decision can be made. And indeed, it may be the case that some local authorities maintain that service provision at a local level where they feel they're best placed to do so. And that assessment shows that. So therefore, it would be on a case-by-case -case basis, that transfer of funds. Right. I mean, it does sound quite complicated and... Um, you know, there's other areas. I mean, I think, if I'm right, when the colleges kind of came together and everyone was getting paid the same, it took quite a long time to bring all the staff levels in uh, because people were on all sorts of different pay and conditions. I mean, that would be an issue too, wouldn't it, that the staff in 32 councils are probably paid in 32 different ways? Yeah, it definitely would. And, and police and fire was, was similar or had some of the similar issues. We, we have tried to estimate in Table 8 figures for pay in terms and conditions which relate to local government staff that could be in scope for transfer. The, the baseline for that was very difficult to, to get one because there could be 32 different rates of pay, terms and conditions, etc. But we've, we've done our best to show from no staff transferring to all staff transferring what the annual increase for pay in terms and conditions might look like. So it's helpful to note, I think, in Table 8, the bottom two lines are for staff and direct delivery roles for social care. OK, and another area that could be complex is the, the whole thing about assets and borrowing, um, because the point, again, has been raised, I think, by SIPFA that, um, well, I mean, a care home would be the obvious example if it belongs to the council at the moment. It, would that transfer and how much of the borrowing, because probably most councils will have borrowed, uh, to, to finance that kind of thing, although I think in Glasgow actually they, they got rid of a number of existing smaller care homes and built some larger new ones. So again, that, that would have to be case by case, would it? Yeah, it would, and there'll be different arrangements whether local authorities own some buildings like daycare centres, care homes, they could be leased, they could be under PFI agreements. There's, again, we'd have to go into almost a local authority by local authority, but also asset by asset basis to fully understand that. Um, there is publicly available information through the Care Inspectorate about local authority run care homes and other services. So we do have an indicative idea of the level of assets potentially in scope, but we'd have to do much more work with local authorities to understand the current cost base, including things like backlog maintenance. There's, there's various different factors as well as the actual capital value of the asset. I think just to make a point, um, it's absolutely not a foregone conclusion that assets will or would transfer. Um, and I think we would say the same about staff. That will um, be a matter for discussion. I think it's important um, that there is an ability to transfer assets, but um, it is not a necessity. Um, but it's necessary to potentially well, to support the transfer of accountability. Ministers um, may need uh, to have the ability to step in or, an, or appoint an operator of last resort. So I think it's just important that we don't as make assumptions that we are um, transferring all assets or all staff um, before we've had that opportunity to go through the co-design process. Yeah, I mean, I agree you shouldn't be making a sweeping assumption. It just makes it very difficult for this yeah. committee to examine all of this mm -hmm. when it could be all the assets transfer, it could be none of the assets transfer, or it could be some kind of mixture. And, and we've no idea what kind of cost would be used for that. OK, I suspect other colleagues may come back on that as well. Just on the transferring the staff point, the suggestion was made that not all the staff might uh, be covered by TUPE. And I was a little bit surprised about that. I would have thought if they were with the council at the moment or with the integrated joint board, if they came into the National Care Service, all the terms and conditions would be protected. Yes, that, that's right. Um, apologies. I'm not sure where that reference was made. But no, it wasn't yourselves. It was, it was one of the um, okay, no, witnesses. We'd, I would 
not say that that was great. Under employment law, staff have to transfer under two pay arrangements, so there's no detriment in terms of terms and conditions. So that is the principle we'd be taking. Okay, and, and the convener mentioned VAT, and you've said that uh, you would you were going to be. Well, I think the UK government's making some decisions, or the HMRC is, and you were aware of what was going on. Um, just to press you a little bit more on that, I mean, is it possible, dis whatever their decision is and whatever they decide to do, you know, is it possible to design a setup so that we do we don't end up having to pay VAT? Because with the police and the fire, we got into the situation where West Westminster was being inflexible, or HMRC was and we've ended up paying VAT, which we wouldn't have otherwise. I mean, is, is it possible, can you design a system so that we will not pay VAT, whatever Westminster decides? So there are still a number of options open to how care boards will be set up, as to where the commission arrangements will be held, as to whether local authorities will still be service providers at a local level, etc. So there's a number of variables in that, um, all of which will have different effects on whether VAT will be subject to that or not. Um, I suppose the, the two main variables with HM Treasury at the moment are in terms of that wider review at a UK level of whether Section 41 bodies will become a full recovery model or whether the types of care boards, such as what happened with police and fire, could be added to be a Section 33 body. We have had very early discussions at an official level with HM Treasury to understand the process for that. Again, we'd look to learn lessons from things like police and fire. But yes, ultimately, there's still numerous options available to us and we definitely want to understand any VAT implication before making any further decisions. So could we not could you not rule out uh, VAT being paid because we will design a system that fits in with what HMRC wants? I, I don't think it'd be the right thing to look at that in isolation. So I think it's important to think of the number of factors that we're looking to achieve here. VAT not being paid is absolutely one of those, but we need to understand that the model that's set up delivers the numerous things that the National Care Service is trying to achieve, as I say, including not incurring that VAT cost. So it absolutely will be taken in the round of factors. Uh, and is, is that related to what kind of legal bodies the care boards would yes, be? Yes, uh -huh, the, the type of body they're set up as. Right. OK, I'll leave it at that. Convener, thanks. OK, thank you. Michelle, to follow by Liz. Good morning. I suppose my question, going back to the top level, is how did we get to this point? So I think we can agree, even thus far from the session, I mean, I, I'm surprised by the complete lack of what I would regard as fundamentals in the financial me memorandum. And we've, we've covered a number of those here. But I'd like to understand why. I understand that, that an FM is required to be produced alongside a bill. But how do we end up in the position that we've got an FM that is just doesn't even begin to cover the fundamentals? And for us as a committee, speaking personally, I can have no confidence whatsoever based on my experience, mostly in business, that the FM represents any level of accuracy and therefore value for money whatsoever. So how did we get here? OK, so the, the process of development of the bill, um, you, will, you will know about um, the independent review of adult social care um, reported and set out a series of recommendations. Um, and suggested significant change, as you know. Um, obviously, um, the current government committed to the development of the National Care Service and committed to doing that um, in a way that was co-designed with people and people who work in the system and people who use social care services. And that is an essential tenet of this work. Um, the implementation gap that Derek Feely set out in the independent review is incredibly important. Um, I, I think he referenced the world leading legislation that we have on self-directed support, uh, the Carers Act, but his main issue was around the implementation gap. So where we are is um, that we have this world leading legislation which is um, not being implemented um, consistently um, and um, I, I certainly people tell us that it is not being implemented consistently and in a fair way. So the approach that we've taken to the development of this bill is different um, and for good reason. 
And that obviously has implications for the financial memorandum because we have a significant co-design work to do. Um, the bill is uh, an enabling bill, as you know, um, and there is work uh, with people, with stakeholders, to work through the specific costs. So it, it is different um, in terms of in the financial memorandum. Um, the, the costs that have been supplied are based on publicly available information. Uh, there are ranges set out there which give a, a good understanding. But it is true um, that there is more work to do. Um, and as I've uh, already said, there will be clear uh, business cases developed for the detail of the plans which will allow parliamentary scrutiny. So following up on that then, <coughs> so it's policy driven, and I understand that, and I understand clearly, I mean, you're correct, say health and social care being amalgamated has been a, a, a wish for a, a long time, but this different approach has clearly introduced significant other risks in terms of even apportioning or estimating costs up front, because the ranges you've set out are from here to here. I mean, if it was your personal money, you wouldn't be risking it, put it that way. Uh, so how are you going to mitigate against the risk of significant cost overruns in a multitude of areas? And my colleagues have mentioned, I mean, we've got VAT, we've got pensions, defined benefit pensions, we've got assets, we've got staff double running, we've got IT, we've got even uncertainty over the governance of boards. Each one of those introduced additional costs. So how specifically are you going to mitigate the risks in the process you're adopting? Yeah, and I would start off by saying that we are very aware of public value and um, the cost to the public purse. So um, that is at the front of our minds at all times as we are developing this work. Um, the, there are a range of areas that you've highlighted in particular. Um, we, and Fiona's already, I think, outlined um, a number of the risk management strategies, but certainly the programme of work that we have underway at the moment um, is, is very clear about all the risks um, that um, we uh, have in the programme, whether they be delivery risks um, around uh, safety and effectiveness of delivery, whether they are financial risks and um, the range of risks that um, we may, uh, well, that may emerge, um, because mm -hmm. we're, we're very clear that there are a number of risks within this. Fiona, I don't know if you want to say a wee bit about the financial risk management. Yeah, um, to know one of the, the biggest drivers of that range that's given is whether local government will remain a service provider in their local area or not. So until that process is worked through, hence we've tried to be transparent to show that the full extent, if all staff transferred, for example, or if none did. So there is a lot more workings, of course, behind the ranges that are given there. In terms of the financial risk of overruns, again, this sets out a financial estimate at a point in time. We would, through the annual budget process, set a budget for the National Care Service development for that future year that would set out what budget is available for that. And that would be backed up through the business case approach, so the value for money assessment with economic case and financial case in line with Green Book guidance. So we would only make financial commitments when we had the evidence to show that that did prove value for money was there. And you, you make a point based on my own personal experience that arguably any programme plan is only ever accurate after the programme's finished, and that's a standard, standard issue and risk for all spend of this. But actually what you're describing makes that more likely rather than less likely, uh, because with each you're talking about these business cases and the areas you mentioned earlier, uh, at that, only at that point will we start to get a sense from a financial perspective of the risks to the public purse. And there are concerns over the scrutiny of the parliament, which I would absolutely back up my, my colleague, Mr. Mason. And I did look in the financial memorandum specifically on the word risk, and the word risk is only mentioned twice there. But this is, what this is screaming out to me is a huge risks. I feel as though, uh, given w whether you're under pressure of timescales to deliver on this, but at the moment, from a financial scrutiny, I'm looking at a blank cheque for the public purse, and I find that deeply worrying. So have you been, if you'd had your choice, 
would you have produced that financial memorandum or would you have wanted more detail and further breaking down based on the policy provisions? So will you push to bring that forward? No. So uh, I think we have, I mean, Fiona in particular and others have spent a huge amount of time developing this financial mm -hmm. memorandum. And I think that it is um, the nature uh, of the approach, because as I've said, form does need to follow function. And we want to be really clear um, with people um, that what we're developing works for them. We've talked, and you know, we've talked a lot about the risks, and I can provide some real reassurance that as part of the programme work, the risks are very much at the front of our minds, uh, whether those be delivery risks, financial risks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we are absolutely. Um, aware and um, actively managing the, the risks associated with this programme. What people talk to us about um, is the opportunity um, that we may um, be able to, or the opportunities actually that we can achieve through the development of this work. So um, certainly the, the feedback at the forum um, and in other discussions that we've had is um, that there is a huge opportunity here to develop services that really work for people um, and that are consistent and fair. Um, and that is um, absolutely what we want to set out to do, is to maximise those opportunities while managing the risks very, very carefully. So just to finish off on the last point, for more clarity, this will be the, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, this will be the only financial memorandum is that correct? And the way that you will break out the detail and the associated risks and cost, potential cost overruns, which is what we are concerned about, is via the detailed business cases and regular updates to this committee. Yeah, that's right. And again, to reassure, you know, the day that this financial memorandum was submitted, it's not that the work stopped in terms of trying to estimate that financial impact. That's been an ongoing process since mm -hmm. this was put forward in June and will continue to be. So that the detail is as we get more evidence, as we work through that co-design mm -hmm. process, it's a very live process to understand the financial estimates and risks that come with those. So when do you anticipate base lining your estimated costs? What point does that occur? In other words, so we know you're nailing your colours to the mast a bit more. Yes, I mean, this, this is the initial public-facing document to set out the initial mm -hmm. cost that we're projecting. The first programme business case that we put out will therefore set out the next iteration of those costs and will be clear as to any changes from this document to the next, as to which mm -hmm. assumptions have changed, so there's a clear audit trail of that. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Let's be followed by Douglas. Uh, thank you. Can I put on uh, record uh, very similar concerns to those that have been spoken about by my uh, three colleagues so far? Because a financial memorandum is a very important part of any uh, bill, any legislation whatsoever. And legislation is important that when we're passing it, it is good law. And good law has certain principles uh, to it, namely that it has to have a clarity of purpose, it has to be understood, it has to be workable, but it also has to have very strong evidence base. And I think what we're struggling with um, in, in this committee just now, albeit that we're only looking at the financial memorandum, not at the wider policy commitments, is that that evidence base is lacking. And you've just given an answer uh, to Michelle Thompson, which makes clear that you know, this is a very much an ongoing uh, basis, that it will be updated. Our problem is that we have to scrutinise this. Do you accept the criticism that has been levelled at you from people who are about to give evidence later on this, this morning and others who have given us written submissions? I think uh, the convener uh, described it as excoriating criticism. Do you accept that they have a point that there is not enough information for them to make a value judgment about how to proceed with this? So I think we um, have had, well, we have had a number of conversations with the um, colleagues who um, are um, putting forward that criticism um, over the course of um, the last number of months. I think this all goes back to the way in which this bill is being developed. 
and the way in which it is being developed is to use uh, the co-design process. And I absolutely understand what you say about good law. Um, I think the really important point is that, um, yes, we absolutely need to have good law and it needs to be very clearly evidenced, but we also need to have excellent implementation. And working in this way to work with people to co-design um, the, the, the fullness of the National Care Service will help us and help people to um, ensure that we're able to effectively implement the National Care Service. So, so would you accept that um, we've moved too quickly, um, given that you know, you've obviously got to take evidence from the stakeholders who are involved in this, uh, who are the ones who are going to be on the front line of delivering uh, what effectively will be a, a new system? Would it have been better to have a sl slightly different approach to the design of the bill? so that we would have a, a more substantial financial memorandum that was uh, with greater detail than we have just now? Would that, would that have been a better approach? I think we're comfortable with the approach that we've taken. Um, and I, I know ministers are comfortable with the approach that has been taken. Um, I think one thing that is very clear from uh, the people who use services is that they are absolutely hungry for change. Um, so there is a, an opportunity here to um, work concurrently to develop the, the detail whilst at the same time making sure that the bill is both effective, is good law and is implementable. Mm. I, I understand fully um, why people may uh, wish to see a, a policy change. Uh, you're, you're quite right, there, there's a lot of opinion uh, that would like to see a change in the delivery uh, of uh, health and social care, the way that that's all organised. I absolutely understand that. This is about a pr procedure, though. This is about the, the, the actual procedure of how that uh, can best be put into practice. And I want to ask you if you feel that the stakeholders uh, who are giving evidence uh, to both yourselves and to us as a committee, do you think that they are comfortable with the process of effectively being a bit left in the dark when it comes to a lot of the uh, costs uh, that have um, really not been laid out. Do you accept that that's a criticism that has to be addressed? I, I think, well, obviously I can't speak for other people who are giving evidence. They will um, give their own evidence. Certainly um, our engagement um, has been um, very proactive um, and there are um, many discussions underway. I would say that stakeholder feedback is mixed um, and obviously have read the submissions to the committee. Some are um, of the view that there hasn't been enough time and there hasn't been enough consultation. Others, um, as I've already said, are very keen to progress with change. Mm -hmm. I, th I think my final point, uh, convener, is, is that you know, I remember in this parliament, uh, I think Mr Mason uh, cited the example of uh, college uh, regionalisation, um, which was a very substantial change to the uh, college sector. I also remember the Children and Young People's Bill, which is a huge bill, um, and at the beginning of these processes, we had issues about the financial uh, memorandum and just how accurate that could be. Because if it's a very, very substantial piece of legislation, which these were, not only does it take a lot of time to go through the Parliament, um, but particularly in a time like this where inflation costs are obviously rising uh, very substantially, um, that sort of affects the financial memorandum over time. And my concern is that this policy change, which is huge, I'm not going to argue about the merits and demerits of the policy change, but the financial memorandum which accompanies that, it is, you know, it's really important. And I just feel at the moment that we're not in a position to make a very good judgment um, because we don't have enough information. So I would definitely say that it shows the best evidence from the data we had and information we had at a point in time. We have made a commitment to bring further financial information to give that level of detail once we know some of those more detailed design options. And again, so apologies, I've mentioned it before, but I would come back to the point, this, this doesn't make a direct financial commitment. This shows an outline of the costs that the legislation going through could incur, but we will ultimately still, through that budget setting process, through that value for money assessment, through business cases, make sure that we have the evidence before making any direct decisions.
Okay, thank you. Douglas. Uh, thank you, Convener. I was going to go back to um, a point on the VAT. Obviously, that's a, a big risk going forward. So, is there any, you know, what could that be the worst case scenario? And how much are we talking about here? There was a detailed assessment done when IGBs were set up in 2013-14 around the potential VAT impact, which estimated that to be in the region of 32 million. That was done on an individual local authority basis, so there was a collection of data and analysis done. We're not at that stage yet. Again, as I noted, we've, in, we've appointed an independent external advisor to let us understand that high-level impact. We'd look to do that more detailed calculation again over coming months to understand what that figure looks like. But to note, the, the work that was done previously in 2014 showed a potential 32 million impact. Mm -hmm. and would that come back to committee again, then, do, do, we, do we think? Is that, is that what would so that, that would be part of updates that we would give, whether that's quarterly, whether that's through the business cases, the VAT impact on different options within that business case would be set out. So yes, that number that would be part back. of that. OK, thank you. Um, another part uh, what to raise was, it was touched on, I think it was by Michelle, IT costs. It does mention in the, um, in the papers that we've got that obviously a key part of the bill is to um, enable the creation of nationally consistent, integrated and accessible electronic social care and health record. Now, we understand that these detailed costs can't be here as yet, but there's not even any indication of what these costs would be in this FM. So the, the indicative costs will be set out through the strategic outline case when that is published. The, the bill itself doesn't doesn't directly say that a care record will be established. We don't need the bill in order to establish the care record, hence that wasn't a focus of the financial memorandum. But that high-level envelope, of course, will be set out through the strategic outline case as part of the business case process for that record. But do we have any idea what those costs would be at this point then? Or? No, we've not, we've not done a detailed costings on yet at the moment. We've done some preparatory work, so we've done an international comparison of other, that's live at the moment, in terms of where other places have set up something similar. We can look to other, I suppose, large-scale digital projects. The set up of Social Security, for example, has digital costs in its business case, but those aren't directly comparable to this record, so I don't think it'd be right at the moment to give that envelope in this financial memorandum based on not knowing some of the detail at the time it was done. Okay. Um... Going on now to, I think, asset cost as well has been, been mentioned. I think you mentioned that it could be different across different boards on whether they own the assets or, or not. Is that Local authorities may own an, a care home, for example. Yeah. That could be under a lease agreement. It could be under a PFI agreement. We don't have the detail of that at the moment. That would have to be done through conjunction with local authorities. So, but would the aim, and it may be not known yet, would the aim for the new National Care Service to take ownership of those, or would the local authority still be a provider to the National Care Service, or is that still to be, to be worked out? It's still to be worked out. So in the independent review of adult social care, um, and, well, and that's absolutely been um, agreed uh, by ministers. Um, Derek Feely and his panel were very clear that local authorities have a clear role to play in the future of uh, social care and um, absolutely um, could and, in his view, should be an ongoing provider of social care. Obviously, um, as we work through this with local authorities, um, there will be a choice um, for local authorities to consider. Um, but certainly we are keen to continue to engage. We know that many very high quality services are provided by local authorities. That's leading on to my next point. So it will be a choice for local authorities because the statutory duty will move on to uh, the Scottish Government away from local authorities. So local authorities, if they want, and as Mr Mason was saying, that you know, often it costs more than they're actually taking in, they could choose to say, well, we don't want to provide this service anymore. Over to you, National Care Service. You can buy this building if you want. Would that be right? Or? That, that could be one outcome, but there are many outcomes um, that um, lie um, between the current arrangements and that arrangement. So then, as we go through, as you say, the, the business cases, then there will be additional capital costs, potentially, to the, to the Scottish Government to buy assets from local government who choose to, to pull out of this service and, and leave it up to the National Care Service? 
Potentially, yes. And again, there's there's numerous complexities with that in terms of the valuation method to be used for those assets as to whether there's a market value or not. To say things like backlog maintenance, any insurance liabilities on those buildings. So it would almost have to be in a building by building mm -hmm. basis to understand the complexities of each building. And, and I guess also from my time from, from local authority, I remember um, private care homes um, that go into administration, for example, and the local authority having to step in and, and buy that asset potentially to keep, you know, it was some, you know, because it was obviously a residence with complex needs in there that, you know, had to be cared for. So I guess. Going forward, that would be a national care service that would have to step in and, and provide that service and buy that asset if it was felt that it was the right thing to do. Yeah, so that's that was the point I was making earlier about the provider of last resort. Um, so yes. Yep. Okay. Um, and I guess other slight question I had was around some local authorities have alios providing this um, this um, care. So I guess it would be. I guess that would, in the future, be decided whether that ALIO would still remain part of a local authority or potentially that would move across to National Care Service or whether that ALIO would continue and provide the care as a, as a provider. Would that, be, would that be right? Yeah, we need to do that analysis to understand the most effective model, both in terms of cost and delivery of services. So, yes, we'd have to understand whether those ALIOs would transfer okay. or remain. And I guess the sort of last, last point I was sort of thinking was that um, you know the, the, the Scottish government's um, obviously desire just now is to try and reduce estate, to try and reduce offices, have more people co-located. I guess, but what it looks like from this financial memorandum is that there's actually going to be new offices as this um, extra level is, is created. So is, that, is this not really going against what the Scottish government are trying to do at present? in trying to rationalise. So we try to be transparent in terms of showing what the cost of a new premises would be. We would absolutely try to get synergies with existing public sector estate and not take on new premises where at all possible. But we've tried to be transparent here by showing the upper end of what the costs could be if that was not possible for some reason, if it was deemed not fit for purpose. But absolutely, we'd, we'd look to maximise the existing public sector estate before mm -hmm. taking on any new property commitments. And in terms of local authorities, they've obviously been, well, COSLA, uh, being the voice of local authorities, have been, you know, vocal in here and obviously saying that there's so many unknowns for, for, for their members. So when will they have a bit of clarity for going forward? Obviously, they're probably going to be going into the budget setting process in the next few months. So when will they have that clarity or start to get some clarity? So the intention is to uh, publish the programme business case uh, later this year. Um, what I would say is that we um, continue to engage with COSLA uh, and local authorities on all of this work. Um, it is very, very complex and we know um, that uh, local government have a huge amount of expertise um, that we're, we're, and so we're very keen to work with them. Um, I think there is um, a series of um, the business cases that we've set out um, that we intend to produce and we're keen to work with COSLA and others to develop those. Okay. Final, final point. Sorry, um, obviously, yeah, I think you mentioned earlier that some boards may differ how they provide service you know, between boards. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what you said or, or not. Uh, I'm not sure either. About in, in which context? Well, it's just because I thought the whole idea of this was to prov provide um, consistency right across Scotland, and I'm just trying to think if we're different boards doing things different ways, then do you do you lose that cons consistency across um, Scotland? Okay, so there's consistency of quality and standards. I think we're really clear, and this. Um, chimes very well with uh, local delivery of care. We know that the delivery of services in rural and remote areas, for example, will not be the same as delivery of care in urban areas. Um, we think it's really, really important that there is delivery flexibility um, and that there is an opportunity to co-design services locally so that they're the best fit for people. So. Um, it is that mixture of um, national frameworks around 
both standards and quality and the ability to design services locally to meet the needs of the population. So there will be consistency uh, in, in standards and quality, but the delivery mechanisms might differ across the country. Potentially still have a postcode lottery, depending on where you live on the type of service you're going to receive. Well, I would probably describe that as rather than a postcode lottery, um, because the intention is to not have a postcode lottery on standards and quality, but flexibility um, on the best means to deliver for the local population. And that would be designed along with people to ensure that it met their needs. And you can have that standards and quality, you know, the, have, have that standards and quality as things are just now? Well, we have a number of um, national standards um, at the moment. Um, and what we see at the moment is real inconsistency uh, across the country. Um, I think the, the point is about accountability for those standards um, and um, how people can hold um, those who are accountable accountable at the, the present time. Um, we know that there is significant variation across different local authorities and uh, different integration joint boards. Um, and people tell us routinely that um, certainly uh, things around portability, being able to move packages of care um, and um, the standards and quality that exist. Um, some, we know absolutely that there are very high quality uh, supports and services that are being provided at the moment and uh, the staff groups who provide that care and support are um, extremely committed, very highly skilled um, and very highly valued. Um, but we know that it is inconsistent. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's uh, concluded questions from colleagues around the table. I've still a, a few to wind up with. And first one I'm going to uh, ask is a really a follow-up to, to what Douglas is saying. I mean, it says here that uh, the stated purpose of the bill is to improve the quality and consistency of social services in Scotland. But, I mean, it, from what we've been discussing today, it's like a sledgehammer to crack a nut, it seems. I mean, surely if there's an issue of consistency and quality, as you've just touched on in answer to Douglas, then they should be addressed directly. Um, I mean, where are, these, uh, where are these problems of quality um, and consistency, you know, name, shame? Or uh, would it not just be easier to ensure that, uh, that, that duties are imposed to make sure that they do uplift their standards to, um, to those that are doing best, which I'd be happy for you to name also. Um, you know, uh, it, it just seems to me to be a monumental, as, as, as Michelle pointed out, risk to have a bill of this nature with all the financial implications because there are, you know, a few um, service deliverers who are not able to, are not up, currently up to scratch. So if I can take you back to the independent review of mm -hmm. adult social care, there was a, a huge amount of consultation, a huge amount of uh, engagement with people, uh, with providers of services, uh, etc., that led the Derek Filia and the panel um, to the conclusions that a national care service was required to achieve uh, consistency and quality. And certainly um, around the cross-boundary um, issues that um, were made very clear to, the, to Derek and the panel. Um, it is really important that we have um, the means to um, ensure that there is consistency and quality across the country. At the moment, there is real variation um, and there is no current means um, by which, um, it, you know, in the current arrangements, uh, ministers uh, do not, you know, we've, we've talked a lot with uh, colleagues from local government about local democratic accountability. Okay. And okay. there is currently no means. Oh, OK, sorry to kind of interject there, but I mean, you can say that about any service. You could say that about education as well. It's not going to be the same everywhere. Bin collections probably aren't the same in North East as they are in Aberdeen. Does that mean you have to have a national bin collection service, a national education service? I mean, I mean surely if there's, a, if there's an issue that, that, that it's affecting some local authorities, perhaps this cross-boundary, I don't know how common this cross-boundary 
issue is, but that's what you address rather than throw the baby out the backwater. It just seems it seems a sledgehammer to crack a nut to me. This whole whole uh, policy, and, 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 and I mean, and, and it's not not for us to criticise the policy per se, but it's the financial wraparound of it. Um, uh, you know, is obviously concerned. I mean, one of the Fraser of Allender Institute, for example, said that if the service is underfunded, it's unlikely to be any better than the system it seeks to replace. And obviously, if we're going to be putting colossal sums of money into new structural changes, then that means there's going to be less money available, surely, for delivery at the coal face. So uh, I can't comment on any other services um, that um, might require a, a national approach. But certainly the strong view from the independent review, the strong view from the consultation responses was that a national care service to promote quality, fairness and consistency was the preferred approach. Uh, ministers have absolutely um, got behind that and are, are clear that that is the direction of travel. So um, I, I think that there it is a significant change, um, and we are very well aware of the significance of the, the change and the complexity of the change. I think, though, um, that what the, both the independent review and the consultation have told us is that it is um, well supported by people who use services and supported by people who work in services. There will be others who disagree, um, but... Um, that is uh, not the overwhelming response from the consultation. Okay, so the pri priority now, given that com political commitment behind it, is to ensure that it's delivered as effectively as possible. Now, what you've said throughout the evidence today is you've talked about, for example, um, co-design process going forward. You've talked about working with stakeholders, and you said that you know the engagement has been very proactive. But the Society of Local Authority Chief Executive said in their submission, and I quote. Local government was not involved in the development of the proposals prior to publication of the paper. So, if there's all this, if, all, if there's all this um, um, proactive work, why was local government not involved? I mean, and, and they go on to mention that uh, uh, the consultation provided very little information about what the proposal would mean for vulnerable adults, children, and families to rely on social work and social services. And they also said it was a largely tick box format. So, you know. What are we, as a committee, to, to, to take from that? And what's your response to that? We meet with uh, both COSLA, with SOLAS, with other local government representatives very, very regularly, um, both on the, the current arrangements and improvements to social care um, and also on the National Care Service. Um, we've invited COSLA and SOLAS to be part of the Strategic Delivery Board for the National Care Service and um, to contribute to the programme. So we do absolutely engage um, and did so um, during uh, the consultation process. The, the consultation was very clear um, in the aims that were uh, set out for the National Care Service and the structure of the bill. And local government colleagues um, had the opportunity to both respond to that and engage with us over the course of that period. Okay, no doubt we'll, we'll, we'll question them when we when we have the, the panel before us in the next uh, few minutes. But uh, the, the financial memorandum anticipates savings and efficiencies through shared service across the national care service, but does not acknowledge the corresponding loss of economies of scale for local government. Does does it? And one of the things that's been pointed to us, I mean, I've had this directly from local authorities as well as through the submissions, is the impact on the viability of some of our smaller local authorities. So what, what is the kind of um, unintended consequences, do you feel, in terms of, of the finances of this? So, yeah, I think it's important, again, to note that we're, we're not saying all services would transfer away from local government, where it would be more appropriate for those services to stay in local government, whether it's a smaller more remote rural community, for example, if that economies of scale made it better to, for that service to remain in local government, that is absolutely still an option from this bill and why we would have to engage on a local authority by local authority basis to understand the impact of withdrawing those social care services, to understand what that would look like before any decision is made, so as we're doing that with the best evidence we can have. 
So there may or may not be a withdrawal of 75,000 staff from local authorities. Is that what you're saying? That, that's what's set out, yeah. So the, the total range of staff in scope at the moment from Triple C data is 75,000 staff split between the 32 different local authorities. But the point I'm making is, will viability of the local authority be taken into account or will this be done purely on the, or, or on the kind of isolated nature of looking specifically at this, this delivery of this service? We'll, we'll need to understand the impact across local authorities, absolutely. Okay, now, another thing uh, that Solis have said is, is that, uh, and I quote, organisational changes appear likely to consume much of the total funding available for the NCS, which is stated to be over 840 million by 26 27. This is about half of the total investment in adult social care alone that causes Social Work Scotland and others consider is needed. In addition, this would not include the investment in justice and children's social work and social care services that are desperately needed now. As I asked at the beginning, we're in a situation of financial uh, difficulty, uh, financial challenge in Scotland and across the UK. So how are we going to be able to square the circle of having these huge organisational changes and at the same time being able to deliver for the people who require this service? So I think it's important to note the, the types of costs that are included in the financial memorandum. So there, there's that public commitment to the 25% increase over the course of Parliament, which you've referenced. When, when we look at specific costs, such as in Table 8, the, the pay in terms of conditions costs, which are a substantial amount of the care board's costs, that is for those local authority staff who would potentially transfer to the 75,000. Those costs are in the system, those, those staff exist. That's, again, trying to be transparent to show that those costs would then fall to the care board. But the, the pay in terms and conditions uplift each year will happen within local authorities now. So I think it's the, sorry, it's the organisational change I'm talking about, not the, not the, you know. Yeah, but just when we quote the number there, so in terms of the 25% increase, which is 8 to 840 million, mm. compared to the cost in the financial memorandum, not all costs in the financial memorandum are for organisational change. Some are, but there's substantive amounts for things like pay, terms and conditions. That's what you OK, lastly from me, and the last one in this session, uh, is it your view that uh, the financial memorandum delivers best estimates in the cost of delivery of this legislation? I believe that it does, based on the time it was written, based on the data and Hold on a second. Based on the time it was written, OK, so we're not at the time it was written. In terms of where we are now, which is more important going forward? So, so yes. Things that we've mentioned, like inflation, are obviously extremely volatile at the moment. So, you know, the numbers that are presented for inflation will have to and are being reviewed on a regular basis. But yes, I believe that this does set out the best estimate of the envelope costs that we have at the present time. OK, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a fairly long session. So thank you very much, both to Donna Bell and Fiona Bennett, for their evidence this morning. Uh, we're going to have a break for five minutes. Uh, and then we'll um, take further evidence. OK, thank you.
now continue our evidence taking on the financial memorandum to the National Care Service Scotland Bill and I welcome to the meeting Sarah Waters, Director for Membership and Resources at the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, uh, Sean Waring, uh, Chair of SIPFA Integrated Joint Boards, Chief Finance Officer Section, and Paul Manning, Executive Director of Finance and Corporate Resources and Deputy Chief Executive of South Lanarkshire Council, representing Solace Scotland. So we move straight to questions. And I think the first question I'd like to ask is that what, what do you believe has motivated the Scottish Government to take such momentous uh, steps? bringing forward this bill? Because just to help you all out, I mean, <laughs> you know, because uh, you, seeing as you all want to take the fifth, it seems what they've basically said is to ensure consistency and quality of service. So what is it about the services that uh, lack the quality and consistency that you all want to see? Go on, Paul, I know you're desperate to speak first. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> uh, in terms of what's motivated the, the Scottish Government, I'm absolutely sure it's good intentions, right? And it's a you know a, a, a desire. Right? You, you, we've quoted consistency. We've quoted a, and, and the discussions that we overheard earlier on. A, you know, a, a, an absolute desire. And, and again, th this comes through in consultation to improve the quality of services. And I think everybody, in, including us, including the people who sat here preceding us, would share right, those as goals. I think the issue that we've got is the route via which we get there. Right? Be, because the, the, the change that, that's mapped out uh, in, in the financial memorandum, and that's the, the part that we're here to talk about today specifically, the change that's mapped out is seismic, right? and it means wholesale, complete change for services that, that, that are currently being provided by uh, health and social care partnerships and by local authorities and by NHS boards across Scotland. And it will be far-reaching, and it's got a massive degree of risk attached to it. Mm -hmm. and, and I suppose, you know, coming back to, to the business that we've got in front of us today, in, in terms of the risk, the quantification right, of the, you know, the, the financial change and the financial element of that risk, I, I think, has loose ends in it. Right? And I think they're considerable and I think they're far-reaching. So, you know, coming back to, to your question, Chair, it, it's, it's absolutely founded on good intentions. We all share the good intentions, but we've got misgivings about the path that's being laid out to take us there. I mean, to be fair, I think it's more than misgivings, having read all three of your submissions. I mean, I think, you know, that you, there clearly is, is strong, from what I am reading, correct me if I'm wrong, opposition to this whole philosophy in the bill. And, and, and obviously, you've been, you we're looking at the financial aspects of that. But what alternatives uh, could the, the Scottish Government um, deliver if it was not going down this uh, 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 path, uh, Sean? I, th I suppose going back to the, that other point as well about the role of um, the care inspectorate and, and about that quality and standards. No, we do have mechanisms in place currently um, that uh, look at quality of services and drive that quality up. I suppose the question is, how do we build on the existing arrangements that we have in place? Um, integrated joint boards have been up and running for seven years. It's not a long length of time, but there's also a, a lot of reserved legislation there that could actually be brought in to take them on to the next step. But it seems that we are actually you know, throwing the baby out of the bathwater and starting again. So some of the aspects that could actually be taken forward is actually to develop integrated joint boards further. And the original legislation allowed for that to happen in due course. So I think there are options to take that forward and allow the integration joint boards to grow and be a bit more independent and to run more of these services um, as the intentions were originally set out. So Sarah, is that SIPFA's view? And uh, you know, there, there is an element of frustration, I understand, among Scottish ministers and other MSPs, the fact that there still is this inconsistency and there isn't the same level of quality everywhere. The, the build team, as you'll note, talked about, for example, specific issues cross-boundary. I don't know how big an issue that is. 
I mean, I think obviously COSLA will maintain the position that part of the reason for the, the, the perceived inconsistencies, the, 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 quali the differentials in quality is because councils have had to take really tough choices over the last 10, 15 years in relation to resources and really no area has, has been left untouched um, by those decisions, whether it's, we heard um, some of the previous speakers talking about the lack of investment in, in assets, you know, care assets, uh, fleet for, for social care workers. You know, there's a range of areas where councillors have had to take those tough choices. And I think to use the term, I think it's really overused now, postcode lottery. It's not a lottery. You know, we don't, we don't take decisions out of ball machines. They, they go through due process in council chambers with considered offer, officer opinion. So it's not a lottery. It's just different. Um, and I think that, you know, what, what I think Paul's absolutely right, we are motivated by the same things. And I think if you look at policy areas like early learning and childcare, the, the end was not potentially not as prescribed as, as the, the National Care Service answer. I think we worked with Scottish Government in a space that was about thinking about different types of service provision in dif different local areas, what was going to actually uh, be most appropriate. But I think in, in this case, it's, it's that desire for absolute consistency um, has meant that, yeah, we, we, well, it's, it's got us to where we are. We, we don't have that... Con Every ELC service is not identical, but we're delivering the, the policy intent, but we're delivering it in different ways to respond to local circumstance. And I think more of that approach potentially could have been taken in, in this to, to, as Paul said, get to the, to the same end goal. Mm -hmm. um, now, consultation, I mean, at, at the start, which obviously you missed because you were travelling here, um, uh, the consultation, all your responses was when, when the question was asked, uh, did you have adequate time for consultation? You all responded with one word answers, which was no, and I did actually put that to the, the bill team, uh, who obviously tried to defend the, the, the consultation period. But I wonder if you can tell us how much time do you feel there should, could have been for consultation? How could that be improved? What further consultation can there uh, be, and I'm going to be asking all three of you this, so it's not so. So I, I, I'm keen. And what is your view? What what confidence do you have about the level of engagement in terms of the co-design, which I believe the bill team mentioned on at least four separate occasions in the previous session? They've they've, they've talked about being um, proactive and engaging with stakeholders, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that doesn't appear to be. Your, your collective view. So I'm just wondering if you can talk us through that. Perhaps, Sarah, do you want to go first on this occasion? I think that, yes, I mean, you can't deny there has been a, a, an engagement and consultation process, but this is, this is huge. You know, this is not just a, a, a kind of standard policy consultation where you can just uh, sort of roll out your national standards for community consultation and engagement. But I think the other problem is the definition of stakeholders. Uh, you know, there's... We, the, the three organisations um, represented today are not just, um, they're, they're pretty significant stakeholders. If you take the, 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 the amount of staff, for example, the, the fact that this could potentially remove a third of, of, of staff and, and budgets from local government, it's a pretty hefty stakeholder in the whole process. So I think it's the, the nature of the, the, the process has been a kind of one size fits all in terms of how you in, engage and, and how they've um, consulted. And actually, it was quite difficult you know, to, for, for organisations like ourselves to put forward that view and make sure that, the, that everybody was aware of the, the scale of the stakeholder um, in, in this case. So I think that has perhaps been part of the, the, the issue um, uh, during the process. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point to, to, to have made. Um, Sean? I think the challenge for us was it came at a time when we were actually looking at recovery and we're still actually dealing with a, another wave of COVID and it also happened over July and August which is the main time when staff trying to get some annual leave as well so trying to get um, the work done uh, on that consultation over that period um, was challenging uh, for us with the, the context in which we were all dealing with so I think another few months for us to do some further work on it, but also to try and understand, you know, what was actually in the document and what it was saying. 
And like Sarah, I think the, the comment about stakeholders and engagement, um, no, we work in this arena day in, day out, but um, we were involved um, just like um, all the other stakeholders. And actually, we feel it would have been better if there were actually more detailed involvement and, and a better understanding of what it is we do and a better understanding of the services involved and what the implications would be for this. And actually, a more detailed engagement with us would actually be more helpful um, as part of this process. But as Sarah says, we are treated just like everybody else. And on one level, I do understand that, but um, the implications for us are significant. And I think it would be more helpful to have a more detailed engagement with us as we go through this process. But yes, a bit longer, particularly the time when this came, would have helped us all to respond um, and deal with it better collectively um, across Scotland as we all work. Thanks. Yeah, so basically what you're saying is there that the consultation, because it was, you know, there were so many people consulted, that your own contributions have been hugely diluted in terms of how, uh, what's been taken on board by the build team, uh, uh, you know, uh, as, we, uh, as a financial member and has been put together. Paul? Just, yeah, I, I, again, I would back everything that Sarah and Sharon have said. Uh, you, you mentioned, Chair, that there's a, a, sort of a theme of cursory no responses in terms of did you have enough time to respond to this. Now, a lot of that is driven, as Sharon says, by the time frame across which this was done, which did feel uh, unnecessarily compressed. Like Sharon says, in a period in late summer when a lot of people take holidays, one of the things that you do, uh, you know, again, you'll, you'll pick that up from the SPICE summary that's in there, there's a consistency to the responses and a consistency to the themes that were in there. So the bodies who responded, I don't think had enough time, drew on views that were there but which have already been expressed to the Scottish Government for a, for a period of time, right, across which, a, you know, for, a, for a period of time across which dialogue around this has happened. Right, so that there is, there is a, a consistency of theme within those uh, which was there to be drawn on. But the, the point I would make is it doesn't feel as if that side of the argument is being listened to and the, the, the outcome that we're being pointed towards, which is a huge change, doesn't seem to vary across this. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, you, you've mentioned uh, Sharon about the, you know, the, the you know the, the the importance of strong financial leadership, and you talk about the fact that, um, you know, uh, this hasn't been recognised uh, in the consultation, the financial memorandum, or indeed the bill. Uh, and you talk about um, the lack of robust uh, information. So, for the record, I mean, you've you talked about some of it in your submission, but what, what uh, additional uh, um, information do you feel you would require at this point? I think we've highlighted um, our particular concerns around VAT, around pensions, um, around information around assets and transfer of assets and implications for that. Um, that, that is a, a big concern. Also, the status um, of the public bodies as well. Um, there's no, currently, we are Section 95 officers. There's no reference to what the status of um, the Chief Finance Officers will be. There's no uh, status on the legal uh, status of what the bodies will be, which then leads, obviously, to concerns around VAT. Um, and as I say, there are, I think there's a big risk around VAT, and I also think it's a lot more significant than the figure that was quoted earlier on as well. Um, just now, we do um, are able to reclaim VAT. Um, no, if I look at my, my own area um, as a um, IGIB and having that status as a 106 public body, we can reclaim uh, all the VAT. I reckon, um, based on if it changed tomorrow, we couldn't recover VAT alone it would be seven million for us. We are eleven percent of Scotland. No, so that gives you an idea of the range it could be and it could be further, um, depending on the extent of services that are in scope. So I, I think there's huge risk there and I do think we need to understand a lot of these areas first before we go forward because these will actually have a significant uh, cost implication if we don't understand the legal status, 
what the, the rules are for that body and VAT and pensions and all the other uh, issues around uh, buildings and transfer of assets and the cost of maintaining these buildings as well going forward. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you've said in, in your submission uh, that uh, the level of uncertainty and remaining unknowns do not allow for any certainty around the reasonableness and accuracy of the costs and savings included. Uh, and you go on to say that the use of large ranges and costing do demonstrate the uncertainty within the financial memorandum. So just wondering, uh, I put this question obviously to, to the bill team when you were there. Uh, do you feel that the, that the financial, memorandum, financial memorandum has met its, the, the best <coughs> estimates criteria? In relation to um, the cost of the bill, um, as it's laid out, um, the figures and the ranges there do look as if they cover the cost, albeit inflation has significantly moved. However, there are gaps, and they recognise in the financial memorandum that there are gaps, and it's the gaps actually that we are concerned about, because those gaps we think will bring significant costs, which will add uh, to um, the implications here. Also, the one area I am a bit concerned about, though, is the range for um, new demand for services. That um, is growing significantly. We have seen increases around um, demographics grow, um, particularly um, post-COVID. And what's built into the um, financial memorandum is only 3%. And just now, we are seeing ranges of between 4 and 6%. So it is running higher than that. And we know that we have got an ageing population, and I think the challenges for future years are only going to see that grow. So that area is possibly an area that's on the light side. OK. And, and Paul, you've basically said that uh, while the financial memorandum acknowledges that follow-up is required, there should be another thing prior to the publication of the bill to support adequate scrutiny. OK. Uh, yeah, coming back to uh, the, the, the question that's there, there at the back of that, uh, in terms of what is in the financial memorandum right, and, and whether it, it represents information that, that Parliament... Funnily enough, that was to be my next question, actually. Funnily enough, I mean, my next question was going to be, so you may as well ask it just now, is what should be in, uh, uh, and what shouldn't be in the FM? Is there something, uh, anything in there that shouldn't be in it? And what additional content should there be? So you may as well ask that. OK, right, thinking. so it's a, 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 again... A number of points around that. In, in terms of what is in there, right, there, there is a representation of what's spent currently, right, which, is, which is drawn in, but it's based in 2019-20. As Sharon says, it's then uplifted uh, for demographic pressures by a level of 3%, which is an assumption of itself. And there's a, an estimate of inflation, right, which sadly right, will be by now dated. Right, moving forward across a period of years. What I, I would need to, right, as, a, as a local authority director of finance, weigh that up against is we've got a, a spending review that's based on flat cash settlements for local authorities without demography uplifts or inflation. Right? So you've, you've got spend currently with limitations right, in terms of what's in there. But that doesn't represent what the cost of a national care service could be. Right? So that, there's another leap of faith in turn in that. So it doesn't represent the full costs uh, of the, 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 you know, the outcome of the FILA review, the, the national uh, care service consultation. You can't see the total costs. You're not able to look at what the priorities would be within that, or to, to properly compare alternative models against what's laid out in that financial memorandum. Our point of view, I, I believe, is that we, we think we're, we're entitled to a clear picture of what this would cost, and, and that would extend to, to things like improvements in the service, which is what everybody is after, and investments that need to be made. So, you know, acknowledging the financial memorandum does set aside uh, a number of improvements around health and social care, which, which are aspect, other, you know, other aspects of government policy, not directly related to this bill. But they probably are uh, requisites for success of a national care service. So that, that's, in, in terms of the, the comments that were made in, in the, the Solis submission and in other submissions around you know, the, the, the 
misgivings, right? I'll use that word again, around what's in the financial memorandum. It's founded on that. And, and again, th there, is, there is a piece of this for me which is about what is this going to cost in total? And you know, we, we talked earlier on about a, a figure that's referenced within the, the, the spending review of £840 million, and an explanation was given of that. But if we weigh we up these things and weigh up the cost of structural cost and compare that to £840 million, is there actually money in here to fund improvement? And, and that's something that is genuinely concerning, I think, for everybody within the local government community. And, and again, you know, I, I appreciate that there are, there are pieces that need to be kept out of the financial memorandum, but there's also, I think it's just paragraphs uh, 16 onwards, there is a, a summary of, of economic benefits. But I think it's reasonable to assume that all of the system changes that are in the, the orbit of, of health and social care at the moment are referenced in the benefits that would accrue from that improved system. So, just a, a number of, 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 I believe, shortcomings right, in the financial memorandum, a number of leaps of faith, but they take us to a position where we are acknowledging there's a risk in making a massive change. OK, thank you. And Sarah? Yeah, and I'm glad Paul mentioned the, the resource spending review because that was published at the end of May and then the financial memorandum came out in June. So the, 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 the resource spending review said that the, the 840 million um, figure, now that could be swallowed up by the, the, the cost of running the service and the set-up costs because I think they come to about 750 million. I think it's welcome to see in the FM that actually they're acknowledging that there, there, there is increases in demand and there has to be increases in cost, but nowhere else do we get that recognition of those um, cost pressures and demand pressures. The RSR absolutely did not do it for local government. It has stated 10.6 billion core funding between now and I think there's 100 million uplift in the last year of the spending review. So I'm not quite sure how on one hand we can acknowledge that yes, there are cost pressures, demand pressures, and yet in a resource spending review say to local government, well, I'm sorry, we, we don't recognize population increase, demand increase, inflation, inflation, pay, pay inflation, it just doesn't, you know, and, and one was published the month after the other. Uh, so I, I do welcome that they've considered that, but I think we need to welcome, we need to do that across the piece and not just in one particular area when there is a solution in, or, a, or a proposal in, in mind. Yeah, I don't necessarily want to speak for my colleagues, but I'm, I, I probably be on safe ground to say I think we were all concerned about that particular aspect uh, of it. I'm just going to ask one more question before we move on to our colleagues, and that's about viability. I kind of asked that of the bill team, and I don't think that they gave a particularly comprehensive response. But um, it, Paul, you mentioned that the last time you were at committee. What, what's, what's, um, we'll kick off with you first. What's your view in terms of the impact on viability, particularly for small, smaller local authorities, but also the kind of economies of scale that you would have within other local authorities, such as South Lancashire? No, uh, uh, listen, you're absolutely right. I did mention this the last time I was here, and the the. At the back of this, that there would be, you know, again, I make an assumption about how this is going to work, right? I'm assuming there's going to be, as is referenced in the documents you've all got today, a transfer of 75,000 people to a national care service. So you, you have a, a, an exodus of that activity, that workforce, the support structure for that from the local authority side of things. So that's about a third of what a local authority does. And you know, colleagues who, who were before you earlier on mentioned, yeah, these things are happening, these, these costs are incurred, these people exist. It, it presupposes that the, the folk who are doing a, you know, th those support and administrative tasks for health and social care partnerships are discreet and are doing that for the health and social care partnership alone. It's not the case, right? You know, Things don't work in silos like that. You, you would be aghast if they did, right? So, you know, there are a, there are flexibilities, there are expertise that stretch beyond health and social care. People will support other things as well as that. Particularly in smaller local authorities, you, you're going to get those crossovers. So, those people leaving, right, is going to have an impact on the critical mass of what's left. And again, this isn't a plea to preserve local authorities or just leave things the way they are. 
where I'm coming from in saying this is we need to acknowledge that that's implicit in what's been put to you and in the financial memorandum. But I don't think it's adequately recognised in the financial memorandum so that there is a cost and there is a risk of saying you know, to, to local authorities, we're going to take that proportion of what you do away from you. You're going to lose a critical mass within authorities up to, you know, and, and you know, my own is the fifth largest authority in Scotland. There are aspects of what we do which will strain because of this. Right? So I, I just I don't get how smaller authorities are going, are going to you know, be able to come through this and be able to provide services in the way that they did before. But it's not recognised in here, and, and that's the bit that concerns me. Sarah. Yeah, I think there's also something, and it's not necessarily viability, you know, financial viability, but you've, we need to think about this in the, in the context of local democracy as well. And you know, what this will do to the, the, the kind of scope of, of decision making locally is, is significant. And I think before COVID, we were look, going through the local governance review and we were looking at fiscal, functional and community empowerment. And there were some pretty radical proposals coming from some council areas along with their partners about things like um, single public authority and that, would, that was looking very much at fiscal and functional empowerment and I think there's a danger that you know, this, this closes some of those options down. I mean I heard what the last speakers were saying about it can look different in different areas but I still think there's something about the interaction between that potentially local models that make sense for example in island communities. I, I don't think it's any secret that Western Isles and Orkney put some, forward the single public authority models but you know first of all Scottish Government has, has kind of kicked that review um, somewhat into the long grass. We are trying to get it back on, on board but things like National Care Service really do impact on um, what, what's going to be kind of left um, in terms of local democracy. Yeah, big fan of single public authorities myself, but uh, we'll now expand around the table uh, to include uh, Douglas asking questions to be followed by Michelle. Uh, thank you. Just following on, actually, you mentioned the local governance review. Has there been any more work on that? Because you're right, this, this plays a, a this, you know, has a huge impact on, on that review if, if social care suddenly comes out of being under local government's responsibility. We are getting back into discussions with civil servants um, around that, but recognising that the context is extremely different. So there is a team in Scottish Government now engaging with COSLA on that. Because mm -hmm. this really should go hand in hand with that, that review, I would, I, would, I would think, anyway. Yeah, and, and just your point, convener, about single public authorities, that was just one example. You know, th th there were other kind of examples that came forward as well about doing things differently. We already see in Highland, there, you know, there's, there's the lead agency model. So it's, it's not as if... You know, the, the, there are other options um, out there. So I think that the local governance review is going to be really challenged by the National Care Service solution um, in this current form. Yeah, you know, one of the things I was asking the, the Bills team about earlier, obviously this, you know, this is obviously a, it's a political will for this to, to happen. So it, it will happen in some form. Up, We just don't know how it's going to be yet. So what would the local government's preference be? Would it be to... You know the transfer of 75,000 jobs, transfer of all assets. You know, Scottish government take the whole take the whole lot, or is it to be still a provider to the national care service where you still maintain the assets, you still maintain most of the staff, the statutory duties gone to the the the, um, the Scottish government, the, the provider of last, last resort that's gone to to them. Some people might actually think that's a, a good thing. So, what would your preference be for how it's shaped up? I can answer that uh, to start off with, Mr. Lumsden. The, uh, you, uh, in, in terms of preference, right, and there's an element of this that I'm giving you as personal preference, yeah. right? The, there, are, there are structures there, right? There is a structure there with health and social care partnerships, which Sharon mentioned earlier on, have, have other powers that could be taken, right? Within the, the legislation that, is exi that exists, that envelope could be pushed. That's a structure that's maturing. Right, and developing, right, and has had a period of time to embed. But it's not that long right, since that change was made. And in the midst of that, we had a pandemic, right, which these organisations were absolutely at the fulcrum of. Does it need a reinvention of that system in order to deliver improvement is where I would come from. There was reference made earlier on right, to a desire to improve 
uh, consistency, but to improve quality as well. That, that, that's paramount in this. Could the role of a national care service right, be to, to, to sit within the existing structure with a remit of, of looking at quality and consistency and delivering on that, as opposed to you know, going back to the point you made a second ago, just you know, the, the consolidation of 75,000 people into, into something new that needs to be set up, administered, run, and a system that needs to be changed right over the short to medium term. And is that, is, is that the best way to progress at this point in time? So if, the, if there was an alternative, personally, that would be my own alternative. So you would potentially still have the, the boards that the government seem intent on doing. You still have the boards, and then there would be what commissioning services from the, maybe the, the IGBs or from other places, and still set in the quality and consistency that you talk about as well. I, I think in, in terms of the, the picture that I, I was trying to present, right, if, if there was a, a national care service within this, I, I, you know, I probably wouldn't be advocating a change away from the existing system of health and social care partnerships. But if there was a, a new uh, body inserted in there with a mandate of, of looking at you know, quality and consistency in, your, in tandem with other agencies and uh, regulators that are there at present, right? specifically to look at that within the, the existing structure, right? is that a way ahead? Mm -hmm. And the statutory duty would still remain within local authorities then? Yeah, in, in, ter in terms of a preference, right, and, and the preference that I was, I was looking to express was that, right, you, know, the, the, you could exist with the structure as it stands, pushing, pushing out potentially uh, the, the boundaries for health and social care partnerships, take, taking them to their limit, right, if, if, if that's what's wanted, if that's what's required, if that's what's asked for at a local and a national level, but is there space for something else, right, that could ensure quality and where appropriate consistency, because there has to be, and there is within the current system, room for local decision making and, and, and room to make decisions that suit local circumstances. And that's a strength. Mm -hmm. Sharon, have you got any views on that? One of the, the key things I think that works really well is the strategic and operational, uh, when, when those sit together, and what works really well for health and social care partnerships is having that strategic and operational responsibility. It works really well, works really well on the ground. There is local arrangements because we don't all have consistent services in just now. And I think if we did all have consistent services, that would definitely be an improvement. And I think going forward, um, as I said earlier on, I think we look for a hybrid model. I think a lot of the work that's getting done in IGIBs are, are, are really good, but we can make improvements. But I think, as Paul says, that overarching bit, uh, essentially, to help drive forward quality and consistency would definitely help. Again, quality and consistency of the services that are in scope would also help. But don't separate out the strategic and the operational aspects, because that's the one thing that actually makes the biggest improvement uh, around service delivery. Mm -hmm. But again, a hybrid model for, from mm -hmm. us, building on what we've already got, rather than starting again mm -hmm. and putting the money into frontline social work services and into the provision, we would see the money better spent. Because mm -hmm. it was interesting to hear from the, the Bills team that you know, there were still going to be inconsistencies, depending on whether you're rural or urban anyway. So it, it wasn't going to be uniform right across mm -hmm. Scotland anyway. So for my thinking, it's maybe changing from 32 different um, setups to maybe five or six. I, I don't know how many boards there's, there's going to be. So yeah. um, we'll see going forward. That's all I've got just now, Camille. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Michelle, to four by John. Uh, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> I read all your submissions with great interest and I share your concerns about some of the areas that have already been touched on around VAT, pensions, assets, governance and so on. And I added in the last panel in some of, of my own. However, uh, just in the interest of uh, giving every panel an equally hard time, I just want to ask some questions and point out that any change that's made that's either perceived to or removes responsibilities is always resisted by the affected body. So my question to you all is, to what extent are you A, simply resistant to change, and B, protecting 
your own turf, if you like. Sarah smiled, she can go first. <laughs> So, very interesting question. Obviously, we weren't here for uh, I'd be interested in the, the responses from your last panel on that. I think that in terms of resistance to change, I think local government has had to do a lot of change over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and I think we have shown that where, where the, the kind of context is set right for that change, that we can work really constructively on, on getting an answer that is, is right for, for each local area. Um, I think through things like the statement of the joint statement of intent, I think we showed that actually we know there are areas where we want to see um, change and improvement. So I'd, I don't think there's resistance. I think it's, I think we would want to see it carefully, incrementally, and in a considered way. But I mean, there are areas like, for example, workforce planning, where we absolutely want to see a change. It is an impossible task for each each health and social care partnership to, to grapple with that on an individual level. So there would be no resistance to change in some of those areas that Paul was talking about. Workforce planning, training, um, you know, terms and conditions, fair work agenda, ethical procurement. These are types of things that we absolutely wouldn't... I don't think you would find any resistance to those things, certainly within local government. But I think it's that, that, that whole-scale structural um, change that... It, I think it, we need we need the detail, um, and that's that's probably the re a lot of the resistance comes from the the, the detail or lack of detail. Sorry, in the yeah. FM. Just building on that, before Paul and uh, Sharon come in, we talked earlier about economies of scale, and I think it was yourself that mentioned that, Paul, in terms of the loss of economies of scale for local government. However, there is a correlate to that, which is a benefit of economies of scale to the Scottish government. And I'm asking about this because as we all the way through this session and on a continual basis, we're all commenting about, you know, public sector funding. We're in a precarious uh, position. So what specific economies of scale can you see with at least some of the proposals for the Scottish Government and therefore for the public purse, given that it strikes me, and I've put this on record before, that for us to have 32 local authorities with duplicate functions right across the board isn't necessarily the most efficient way. So I'm interested in your thoughts about where the economies of scale are for the Scottish Government rather than the disbenefit of economies for scale to yourselves. Okay, well, I'll, I'll come back in on that first. I, I, I suppose if I point back to the financial memorandum, th there's a significant cost in there in, mm -hmm. in terms of local and national boards. And, and the extent of the costs does leave me wondering, where are the economies of scale? It doesn't mention scale? economies of scale no. in the financial memorandum. So, so, so that, that's, that's the, the perspective that, that I've, I've got on it. That, that there is a figure in there, I think, as well, of 25 to £40 million, pounds, right, which is assumed as being the costs currently right, of, of supporting and running these services. But there isn't any background to where that comes from. So... From the perspective of the financial memorandum, that, that I believe is one of the, the, the shortcomings in it, right, is how it identifies if there would be savings in moving from a, a series of health and social care partnerships to a system of a, of a national organisation and local boards, regardless of how many of those there are. So that is an issue I've got with this. And Sharon, do you want to come in on either of those two questions and then one yes, more thing? Um, no, we have been very much at the forefront of this change, so we are not resistant to change, and we actually are keen to see um, the health and social care partnerships develop further. So that's not our issue in relation to this. I think from where we're sitting, um, if you look at economies of scale, the one way to do it, the obvious one which um, isn't um, pulled out is the fact you would reduce from 32 to a smaller number. Um, and it doesn't commit to what that number would be. Um, so that's the, the obvious way to bring that economies of scale and, and make savings. I think the, the opposite uh, challenge is, is size and scale and that connection back to local communities, because that's very much what we build our services on. So I think there's a challenge to get the right balance when you look at, going forward, the economies of scales, but also that local community connection because that is really what these services need to be built on. 
Okay, thank you for that. My last question then is actually, and I brought it out earlier as well, in terms of process, in terms of the production of the financial memorandum, it's got to be produced alongside the bill. That is a matter of process in this place, if you like. But it strikes me that for a very large bill, and somebody referenced colleges earlier, which I imagine was similar. I mean, this is absolutely huge. Uh, and in reality, I can't see how a financial memorandum with any degree of accuracy whatsoever can be produced at this point in time where there's still huge questions over the requirements and the enactment and so on. I asked earlier in the, the earlier panel about that, about how we as a committee are going to ensure that there's adequate financial scrutiny. That's our primary purpose. And the assurance I got back was that the resultant business cases con containing the risk assessment as well would be brought forward to us. So the, my question to you from the other side is, w will that, in your opinion, be adequate? Because I think we all agree there are significant gaps in the FM as it stands at the moment. So will the process as it currently functions from a scrutiny of financial perspective work? for something of the scale? Yeah, I don't think it will. Right? And, and I, I, I think the, the, there's a summary in, uh, at the end of the SPICE briefing, right, which lays out the risks right, for, mm -hmm. for the committee. And it, refle it reflects on the work that's been done in the financial memorandum. Right? And, and it acknowledges that it's, you know, it is what it is. It's the, it's the best estimate at this point. But it goes on to list a number of omissions and shortcomings, right? And then it makes the point that where decisions are taken that are implemented through secondary legislation, and, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer or an expert in parliamentary law, and you'll know far better than I do, right, you know, where those distinctions lie, they're not usually the subject of a financial memorandum, right? So, so the system and the financial memorandum as it stands, I don't think would propel that back in front of yourselves as a committee. So the, the short, honest answer from myself is, no, I don't think this is going to work. Mm. Anybody, Sarah or Sharon, want to add to that? I, I, I just think there's a significant areas where there's more detailed information required for uh, to establish that it's a robust financial mm. memorandum. And I think some of the questions that we highlighted around the <coughs> legal status of the, the boards uh, and the VAT implications, et cetera, and what that's going to mean going forward um, could add significant costs, um, which I think if there was a more detailed business case done as part of this process to start with, I think we'd have had more sound um, and secure costings. And I think just to add, I think because there's going to be such a, or there would be such a residual impact for councils financially, I think there's, there really need to, we need to see a process for how, for example, that's going to be um, monitored the kind of audit and scrutiny and, um, and inspection bodies that deal with local government. How are they going to kind of assure um, government ministers during the process that you know the, the, the way in which money is being accounted for is is it, it's just going to be really really complicated because of the that kind of interrelationship. So I think we need to see some kind of plan for that as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so just to get absolute clarification on that, just a, a one-word answer I'm looking for is, should the financial memorandum be revisited? I believe it should be, given where we are. Um, That's a one-word answer? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes. 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 Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, John, to be followed by Liz. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, I mean, the, word, the words best value have been mentioned, and, um, you know, we appear to have... 500 million to 1,000 million over the next five years just going into the structure of this new organisation. So, I mean, if we have that kind of money sitting around, are, are you, is your argument that it is not best value to set up a new structure would be better using that money to increase wages or to improve the actual system? Ms Waters. Yes, I think, I mean, capacity is a huge issue for social care. Um, we, I think we absolutely know that because of demand, because of winter pressures, because of residual COVID impacts, complexity of demand. So, yes, we would, we would invest in the things that are needed to be invested in. So, uh, capacity, fair work. 
um, some of the, you know, if we think about getting to net zero, some of the social care estate will require significant work to get to that point, even the practices in social care, the vehicles that our, our carers are driving around in, this all requires investment if, if we're to deliver better care. Okay, uh, I mean, I'll let you all come in in due, due course as you want. Um, I mean, one of the arguments for this new system ha has been uh, that there would be more consistency, and there's also been the suggestion that it would become more like the NHS, which is a national organisation. But, I mean, it does strike me that the NHS can be quite inconsistent at times. All, all the health boards do things differently. Every GP practice seems to do things differently. Every optician, every dentist, because they're all private. So, I mean, there is quite a mixture in the NHS. I mean, do you think it's, even if we go to a national care service, is it going to be more consistent than we presently have, or is it just going to be a different kind of inconsistency? I, I, would, I would suggest, uh, and, and again, this, this came up in the earlier session, right, uh, that there are a whole number of variables in here, right, and there are a whole number of un unanswered questions. And a theme in the response is, well, well, that, you know, we'll either cross that bridge when we come to it, or that's a decision that can be taken locally. Now, that doesn't take you towards consistency, right? And there was a conversation that, that I listened to earlier on around assets and how, how, how would it work with assets? Would the assets be rented by the care board? Would they become the property of the care board? What would happen, right? And, and the response is, well, well, we'll, we'll see, and that, that, that could be a decision. I think that the response given earlier on was that could be taken on an asset by asset basis. So if you pitch responses like that in amidst all the other variables, I don't think this guarantees consistency, right? I, I, I do think, and I'll go back to what I said earlier, I think it's well-intentioned, but I don't think it gives you any kind of certainty that you're going to get to something that's delivering uh, consistent care services across Scotland. OK, well, I was going to come on to assets and things like that, so let's explore that a wee bit further. Um, I mean, can you give us a kind of idea, uh, and Ms Waring or anyone, um, you know, if we take, say, care homes, for example, or other care assets, um, you know, is there a variety? I mean, are they, are they mainly owned? Are they leased? Uh, is, there, is there PFI in there somewhere? How does the borrowing, does borrowing relate to a particular care home or how does that work? Can you give, give us a bit more kind of background or detail? I think Ms. Waring looks I'll like start, I'll start in. off on that one. Um, so you will find that some of the local authorities do have their own care home provision. Uh, I currently work in Glasgow. We have our own local authority residential care homes, and it's uh, a new, newly built estate over the last 10, 15 years that's been invested in. Um, some local authorities don't have their own care homes, particularly some of the smaller areas, um, and rely on the, the, the private and the independent sector to provide uh, that care home estate. And they are funded through a, a, a range of mechanisms um, some of them um, are very much PFIs or through um, their own arrangements, financial arrangements. The voluntary sector obviously have bought assets in the past and maintain those assets. So you already have a diverse range of financial arrangements across the care home sector uh, just now. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, as it happens, one of the Glasgow's ones is in my constituency yes, uh, in Dilmarnock. Um, I mean, without being too specific, would, would Glasgow generally be using a prudential framework or whatever to borrow f for these kind of developments? So um, there was prudential borrowing for uh, the care homes in Glasgow, and, and a lot of the local authorities would use that arrangement of their own capital uh, towards it as well. So it was a mixture of funding went into those. But w would some councils, if, if, if maybe the care home had been built a while ago, they'd have paid off the debt, so actually the, the asset would not have any debt linked to it? Mr Manning. I, I, I'll, I'll come, come in on that one. G going back to Sharon's point, that there is, there is going to be a mixture. right? So you, you may have situations like that. You're going to have, I would imagine, in the majority of cases with owned care home or care facility right, stock, you, you are going to have a degree of debt attached to it. And, and what, again, the financial memorandum doesn't consider is, how, how is this going to be dealt with? Right, so is that, if, for example, if ownership was to be passed to a national care service, that there would need to be some form of arrangement behind that which supported uh, the transfer of the debt from the local authority to the national care service. But this doesn't get factored in. Right, so again, this is just one of, the, one of a number of uncertainties that 
lead to us having misgivings about what's mapped out uh, within this. And another aspect around assets is uh, what it's going to cost to maintain right, and to, to modernise, but because we're, we're faced with duties right, around you know, move to carbon reduction standards and move to net zero standards over the next 15 years. So those would be costs that would be picked up by a national care service in this scenario. Just now, those aren't in local authority budgets. And frankly, on our side of the table, we're, we're tearing our hair out, figuring out how we're going to get the money together in order to meet those costs. But, but that would be implicit in a move of those assets across to, to a national care service or to these boards as well. So this is really complicated, but it's treated very, very lightly in the financial memorandum. And is your understanding that it would be the local council would decide if they wanted to transfer a particular care home or other asset to the national care service, or would that be the decision of the national care service, or how would that be decided? Frankly, I don't know. Right? And, and that, that's one of, one of the, the things in this that's got an open-endedness about it. Right? And if, if, you, if, you had a, if you had a situation where you know, a, a goal of consistency of standard across Scotland right, is resting on a, an approach which is you know, re reliant on whether individual local authorities about individual assets are prepared to continue running them or not or transfer them to a national care service, it's not a solid foundation to do this. Do we know how many care homes there are in Scotland? It must be hundreds, I'm assuming. There'll be, there'll be hundreds, but we'd need to get you that figure. But it's a significant well, well, that's okay. number. I mean, my point was just going to be, if we're going to look at every individual care home for every council and third sector and private sector, that's going to be quite a lot of work for somebody, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, um, if we move on, I mean, VAT has been mentioned, and I don't, I don't know if either of our, any of our finance experts can kind of give us some background on that, but I mean, I did try and press the officials earlier as to, you know, could they work around the VAT? Are we, have we, got, are we dependent on HMRC and Westminster to make decisions about VAT? Because we did end up paying money, I think, with police and fire eh, that we didn't really want to. Um, have you got an angle on VAT? Are you concerned about that? I think we're, we're absolutely uh, con concerned about it, and, and again, I, I come back to you know if, if there are, along with assets and probably along with pensions as well, right? Th these are things that are really left hanging by the financial memorandum that they're acknowledged as being very important issues that are going to be returned to, and I think in the, the case of VAT, with some expert advice, right, to look at the position, uh, and the financial memorandum, you know, it, it acknowledges this. And it acknowledges the fact that if care boards aren't able to reclaim VAT, then it would have a significant financial impact. So that, that should worry us all from the off. It's possible right, to get uh, you know, exemption from VAT. So I think we mentioned earlier on, you, you've got the VAT Act from 1994. Local authorities under that have got exemption from VAT. But that, that would take time to get there. There is also... A, UK government, you know, I think proposed changed legislation, right, which was looking at getting all public bodies to a position where they would be able to fully reclaim VAT. But I'm, I'm led to believe that that isn't going to be legislated until the middle of, of the decade. So this isn't an insurmountable problem, I don't think, right? But how you would get to the other side, nobody really knows. Right, and it is left hanging in the financial memorandum. And as Sharon indicated earlier, and as you, you point out yourself, if we ended up in the position that Police Scotland ended up in, they were having to face, I think, Police Scotland were having to face VAT bills of around £25 million per annum. Right, and that, that was purely as a result of structural change. They, they moved from one camp to another and they found that they were liable for a VAT bill. And unless that work's done, and we don't know how it's going to be done or by whom, that's the risk that we're really on the wrong end of just now. I mean, Ms Waring, is, is that tied in with the, the legal bodies, the type of legal bodies that we end up with here? Because I think you mentioned that in your submission. I think it is partly tied up with that. Um, 
Because just now we are uh, 106 public bodies, so we are tied to um, local authorities as IGIB, so we can reclaim uh, VAT. So that's part of the issue. But as Paul mentioned, there is other work underway nationally to look at um, VAT, but it's the timescales uh, around that. But we do think, you know, if that can't be resolved, it could be a significant number. Is there a wide variety of kind of legal setups that we could have for the, like for the uh, care boards or, um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what kind of... Uh... I'm, I'm assuming there will be some, um, a range of options, um, but I'm not a, a legal uh, expert. I would need to, to have a lawyer to look at what the options would be to tie it in. But I'm a, I understand there are a number of options you could have. OK, and the, the final area I wanted to touch on was, like, the staff. If the staff are transferring, there was a suggestion, I think it was in the SIPFA paper, that some staff might not be able to transfer under TUPE. So... Um, I think we also mentioned that as well. Our concern is that a number of us are in joint posts and we have responsibility for health functions as well as social work functions. And uh, TUPI has a threshold in relation to how much of your role was transferring for you to be um, transferred under TUPI. And we think some of these posts won't reach that threshold, which is why we're asking the question uh, around that. Right, just to clarify that in my mind. So if somebody's currently got a role that's partly health and partly social care, it would depend how that role was split. So if that person moved into the new body, it might not be Chupi because only a part of their role is Chupi has a threshold where, right, okay. say, 80% of that role has to be a transferable role for Chupi apply. So the question for us, would Chupi apply to, to all these posts? And I think that work needs to be uh, looked at. Right. And presumably, I mean, the 32 councils will have slightly different terms and conditions for all of these staff. So there would be quite a lot of work to if you're going to make them consistent. And then just the final point on pensions as well. Is there a concern? Is, is that linked to the Chupi one that they might not be able to stay in the local government pension scheme? I think in, in terms of Chupi, right, pension arrangements aren't guaranteed in the, the same way as other employee rights are. Right? So, so what usually happens is with a 2 pay transfer, is that pensions that are what they, they describe as being carved out, right? And, and the, the point there is that the, uh, the body to whom the employees are transferring doesn't have to replicate the pension arrangements of the body from whom they were being transferred. So okay. what I'm trying to say in a really long-winded way is there's, there's a, a limited guarantee under 2 pay of pension arrangements for people. Now, that there's a wider set of concerns that we have around pension arrangements, and it comes back to you know, that, that figure, 75,000 people effectively leaving local government. Where are, where are they going? Right? So is, there a new, is there a new pension arrangement for them? And I've outlined some of the limitations that are there around Tupi. But if they, if they were going to leave those pension schemes, what would be the impact on the pension bodies across Would it, would it not Scotland? be neutral for the pension scheme? Uh, I don't know. And, and that's, that's the bit within the financial memorandum that, that is left unconsidered. So what we haven't done right, is an analysis of who would be leaving, what the liabilities would be, what the, the element representing them within the fund would be, and, and what the potential impact would be. But, you know, again, coming from the data that's there, that's a, a, a mass loss of people right, from those pension funds. So that there, there's impact there that's going to have to be considered and worked through. Uh, Ms. Waters. Yeah, I mean, one of the, I mean, recruitment and retention in the care sector is difficult, and one of the, the things that local government tries to, um, you know, to promote, I guess, is, is some of the terms and conditions and some of the, the, the pension arrangements in local government. And I think staff, you know, a new organisation, if it was going to, I don't know if it was going to create, you know, different pension arrangements, it would have to make sure that they were attractive, um, because if recruitment and retention is difficult enough with a good um, sound pension scheme, I think it would be even more challenging um, if there's a lot of uncertainty as well. And I think all the submissions have po pointed out the, the uncertainty this is going to create in a really challenging area. We've already seen the news last night about um, hospitality wanting to recruit, recruit 30,000 people over the next couple of years. That's going to be in direct competition with recruitment to um, health and social care. OK, thanks so much. Okay, thanks very much. I've just been advised that there are 1,044 care homes in Scotland. 
Uh, and both Douglas and Michelle are keen to come in. Is it a supplementary to what's been asked? Is it the same with you, Douglas? Okay, well, what I'll do is I'll let Michelle in with a supplementary, then Liz to ask mm -hmm. the questions. No, no, and then, then it'll be Douglas. It's, it's actually okay. just a, a quick supplementary on the pension schemes. Perhaps I'm not understanding correctly, but the existing pension schemes are defined benefit run defined contribution. Is that right? Yeah. OK, yeah. so therefore, would it not be the case that that actually is a benefit to those schemes? Because given that the liability lies with the provider, where you've got massive inflation and it's a defined benefit scheme, I imagine there's a lot of pension schemes at the moment uh, are, are feeling somewhat nervous. So to my mind, that would actually be a benefit, losing a, a, lot, of, a lot of people from a local council perspective, albeit I accept it's a problem for the two-pay scheme, or am I misunderstanding something? There's, there's probably two points I would make around that. So that the local government pension schemes in Scotland have funds, right? So it, it's not what's described as a pay-as-you-go scheme, yeah. right? Which, which is what, by and large, the, the, the government schemes are. Which is that like, today's pensioners' pensions are paid I used to by work today's in a pensions people. Company, so I'm Sorry. With you. I apologise. Right? <laughs> so you've got these funds, mm -hmm. right? So the question I'm asking, and, and the point I'm making is uh, that it, you know, it is left hanging by the financial memorandum, right? I, I fully accept that. And, and I, I, I'm, you know, the assumption I'm not making, and the work that we haven't done, is to sit round with the pension funds and say, if they did this, what would this mean, right? So. So that is something that is still to happen, right? And that, that's the mm. point I'm making, as, a, as opposed to arguing for, for a benefit or a disbenefit, what it is going to have as an impact. Correct. I absolutely agree with you. And I suppose my point is that where it me, in terms of getting to the detail around the financial memorandum, the fact that these are defined benefits and the liability will lie with whoever takes them on would be a pretty big consideration to get costed up given that liability consideration and would be actually might be quite a benefit because it's a worry for every pension scheme that's got defined benefits but that's a minor thing. Um, Thank you, convener. Thank you. Okay, let's then have a question for Douglas. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wearing, you said something very interesting in relation to an earlier question from uh, Michelle Thompson about IGBs, namely that you felt that there was scope for improvement uh, within that. Um, what, what, do you, what did you mean by that in terms of the role that IGBs have, and particularly in this context, and would that have any implication for uh, the financial aspect? Um, I was referring to the original legislation that was um, put in place to set up uh, integrated joint boards. There was a lot of reserved powers where, which wasn't introduced at the time. And I think there was further scope to develop the IGIBs through the current legislation to develop them further. And there is also opportunities there about more consistency in relation, for example, to the services that are, are delegated to them. So just now across Scotland, we don't all have the same services delegated. So um, one that I'm party to does have adult social care, children and families services, as well as criminal justice as part of the scope. But a lot of other IGIBs only have adult social care services mm. in scope. But that um, legislation had a lot of reserved powers which haven't been yeah, enacted, indeed. which I think would have been an opportunity to explore further without you know, starting again. So, just in that context, I mean, given the concerns that you rightly have about all, all these uh, proposed changes, do you think that there could be uh, changes made to the IGB system that would help provide um, better, uh, as in to try to achieve the uh, aims and objectives that everybody wants to see, but without this major overhaul? I think there are changes that could be made, and I'll give an example. Um, they talked earlier on about people wanting to, to move areas and move their packages of care with them. The, the guidance that we have that covers arts ordinary residents, you know, there, there is scope to go and revise that guidance and actually make changes to that so that people can um, passport their care packages with them um, a lot easier. So I think there is scope to do and sort some of these issues out without having to go through um, a whole series of new legislation, a new body, to then sort some of these issues out. I think there's things that can be done just now. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Douglas? Thank you, Camina. I was just having a look. Um, our, our three councils that use alios to provide um, 
Kier, one's Glasgow, one's Aberdeen and one's Borders. Has, has there been any work done on the impact of these alleos? You know, I, I'm trying to think whether if local authorities didn't have a statutory, statutory duty anymore, you know, could they still have a, an alleo that's providing that service or you know, what would impact be? Any thoughts? Um, Glasgow no longer has an alleo no, providing okay. care. We are now, um, it's all in-house and it's all part of um, the, the Health and Social Care Partnership. And actually we've seen benefits um, by that coming back in and being uh, under that operational umbrella of the Health and Social Care Partnership. So that would just leave Aberdeen and Scottish borders then. Yeah. So any idea what, whether that could continue or whether it's something we'd have to change? And... I think it was something that needs to be looked into. Um, again, it comes back to that question about um, it should providers sit out with or, and how much of that provision actually transfers into the care boards. Um, and I, I think it relates more to that decision rather than the setup of the alleos. Mm -hmm. Uh, Scottish Borders Council is actually back into council. All right, so it's yeah, only yeah, one. Yeah, so it's only one. Um, but I think you know, we, we, I was just uh, talking to Paul about this, and I think your comment—I I wrote it down, Paul. It just compounds the upheaval. Um, I think it just it adds to the the complexity at a local level, which our colleagues um, previous to this said you know would have to be revisited. And I think we've all been struck by it on a asset by asset local authority by local authority basis. So I think that gets you then right back into the. The, the kind of nuts and bolts of, of building a, a kind of national care service from the bottom up, which, you know, if you're talking about economies of scale and, and management of that, I think it, it's really complex. Okay. Thanks, Camila. Thank okay, thank you. Well, that's concluded questions from colleagues. I've just got three more questions. It's one for each of you, so um, hopefully it won't take too long. So the first one I'm going to ask is to Sarah, and it's about paragraph 68 of the financial memorandum, which basically says it will take... Um, approximately 10 years to reach a steady state number of carers with plans and statements. And it goes on to say this assumes the right to personalise short break support under the Carers Act established with the bill is implemented from April 2025, although that date is still to be decided. Now, given the, the, the kind of comments you made earlier on about demography, uh, uh, rising demand, generally speaking, without this, do you think that even this is a realistic um, timescale uh, uh, basically to deliver that by 2035? Gosh, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> I think, against the context of all the other changes, I think it could be really, really challenging. I also note from the, um, the, the, the upper and lower estimates that it, that it then flatlines from 20, 29, 30. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think that's realistic. I think in any context... I don't think that's realistic. I think demand, well, costs increase, pay increases, demand increases. So I think it's just, it's one part. There's so many moving parts in this um, that I think it's, I think it could be really challenging. Okay. Uh, uh, the reason I said we hadn't had any discussion on that or any questions on that previously, so I thought I'd, I wanted to touch on that. Um, for yourself, actually, um, Sharon, it's a... Uh, this uh, issue in your own submission, you say that there's concern that the recommendation to increase free personal and nursing care for self-funders will not necessarily deliver a, re a reduction to the amount paid by self-funders. I'm just wondering if you can expand on a wee bit about what, you, what your concerns are there. So our concerns is that uh, the care home providers will put their rates up and uh, the people won't then see the benefit uh, of that increase. And... Um, as you'll be no doubt aware, um, the rates for uh, privately funded um, service users are significantly higher than the, the rates that the local authority contracts would have. And we did see this before when we um, seen the introduction um, of free nursing and personal care, that the rates for um, privately funded clients did go up. And, and none of these go through the local authority uh, contracts, so we're not able to provide a level of protection either uh, to those service users. Okay, that's that's very important. And and uh, for yourself, in, in terms of your own submission, uh, Paul, you've said that if a new national care service can't be fully funded, then the Scottish Government should agree to the last recommendation, the independent review of adult social care, to consider and consult on options for raising new revenues to increase investment in social care. care. Now, what kind of new revenues uh, and options would we be talking about potentially? Okay, so uh, I, what we're talking about there is the broader picture in terms of the tax and revenue raising 
the situation that exists within Scotland. And what that points to is the fact that you know, at, at the root of, of many of the issues that people have with the care system is funding. Right? And that, that's, again, it's a, it's a theme that's there within those submissions. And it points across to, and I think Mr Mason made the point earlier on, if there was an amount of money of that volume that could be put into the system, right, you know, is there a better use of it than structural change? So if there was money to properly address uh, if there's money to properly address demographic change, to address things like inflation, to address investments in the system, there is no doubt that you would get a better system of care. Right? And what the, the submission is pointing to is, can we be alive to every opportunity? Right? And, and I, I get it's a phrase that's doing a lot of heavy lifting to try and generate those funds for investment. Now, that may well be tax policy, it may well be things, for example, like charging for services. But again, with, within, the, you know, the, the, within the move towards the National Care Service and within the financial memorandum, there is a desire to look at charging for certain care services with a, with a view to moving the other way and reducing those. So it, you know, it's that broader picture. It's about proper funding. OK, thank you very much. I'd like to thank our witnesses for their contributions uh, today. We're going to move into a private session now, so I'll just call a two-minute break to allow uh, our witnesses, uh, the public and the official report to leave. Thanks. <laughs>